I'd like to call to order the meeting of Monday, September the 25th, and if the clerk would please read the roll. Councilmember Archibald? Here. <clears throat> Councilmember Ashford? Present. Councilmember Harris? Here. Councilmember Lamb? Here. Councilmember <clears throat> Ruiz? Here. Councilmember Warden? Here. Mayor Rupp? Here. You have the minutes from the September 11th meeting before you. Is there a motion to receive and file? So moved, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Ashford. Is there a second? Second. Councilmember Archibald, is there any additions or deletions? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes will stand as submitted. We do have two presentations tonight on the agenda. If the clerk would please read the first one. Number one is recognizing the Cleveland Elementary School student winners for the summer reading program. Thank you. We have some wonderful young people here in the audience tonight that uh, are very deserving of these certificates for participating in the reading program at Cleveland School. If they would meet me right up here at the podium, I, I would be happy to give them their certificates. This is really an honor to give you these certificates tonight. You all participate in the reading program. You really did a good job, I understand. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Scared. We have Danielle Coronado, who's in first grade. We have Juliana Clark, who's in fourth grade. We have Jamal Walden, who's in third grade. And Ariana Williams, who's in second grade. You should all be very proud of your reading accomplishments. I'd also like to thank Mayor Pro Tem Ashford for bringing this to our attention. It's very important that we recognize the youth of our city. They will be our new leaders someday, excuse me. And this is the way to start. So I think each of you might have something to say, but let me give you your certificates. You'd like to do that, and then each sure. one of them give them an opportunity to I'm say something. Talk first. Okay, step away just a little bit. Hi, I'm Michelle Christick. I am the principal of Cleveland Elementary School, and I just want to give you a little brief background about how these students are standing here before you. We were able to instill a or start a summer reading program at Cleveland Elementary School, and as many of you have heard, we are going to be a K2 literacy center next year. So what we did is we had um, our librarian Margaret Rushton, who I would like to stand. We wouldn't be able to do any of this without her, her help. She's amazing, and we appreciate everything she does for Cleveland. She entered us in a contest, and we won. So we were given 500 books from Scholastic, which was a great start for our summer reading program. Then through the donation of retired teachers, we were able to collect even more books. Each student at Cleveland Elementary went home with four books over the summer, each of them with a postcard, which I have here. The students would read the books, fill out the postcards, parents would sign it, and then they, all they had to do was drop it in the mail. And we were able to do that because of a generous donation through the youth branch of the NAACP who donated the money for the postage. What I would like to share with you before the students speak is I'm going to read their winning cards to you, and then I'm going to let them share with you the book they chose. Each student who won received $30 in Scholastic books, and they got to choose the books on their grade level that they wanted to read. So I'm going to tell how they won or read their winning postcard, and then they're going to share with you the book they, cho they chose and then why they chose that book. So our first winner was Daniel Coronado. He read the book, The Lion King. His grandma says that he is doing so great and um, tries very hard. And you know, as a first grader, reading is sometimes hard. You're just learning, and we're very proud of Daniel. I 
I chose this book because I like my friends and I like playing on foam. And tell them the title of your book. <laughs> and it was Pete the Cat. <laughs> Pete the Cat. <laughs> Our next winner is Juliana Clark. Juliana read the book Madeline. She's, um, her mother said of her, Juliana has come a long way with reading. She is an excellent reader, and I am so proud of her. She's going to share the book that she chose. I chose this book because it's really interesting, and I really love Descendants. And normally I know most of the characters, and when I go to my dad's house, I watch Descendants all the time. Can you tell them the name of the book you chose? And my book is called Descendants 2. Our next winner is Jamal Walden. Jam Jamal won with the book The Gingerbread Man. And... Um, I, is Marissa your sister? I'm not sure. Okay. Aunt, her, his aunt wrote, the more he reads, the better he was able to comprehend the story and its structure. Go ahead. My name is Jamal. I love to read. I was glad to read over the summer. My favorite book was Fidget Spinners. After the big hurricane, I Say my books to children in China, in Texas. Texas. I feel that they, they deserve. deserve great new books to read. So he doesn't have his book with us. He sent it to Texas. <laughs> Our last winner is Ariana Williams. Ariana won with a, with a book called Ballerina Girl. Her mom wrote, she learned new words such as the meaning of ballet and how it applies to ballerina practicing. I chose this book because... Uh, I chose this book because I thought it would be a great book for me. And... I like to have a sleepover with my sister and cousins. Things I like to do with things I like to do like the bears are play dress up, play games, read spooky stories, watch movies, and pretend superheroes and eat snacks. I wish I could play in makeup like the bears did. Can you share your book? <laughs> Staying bear sleepover. <laughs> Do you, any of you have any questions for me? Does anyone have any questions? I just want to congratulate you on a job well done with the students. They're marvelous, and as I said before, they're t the future. So it's, and we it's appreciate nice to see the that. board members who have come and, and donated their time to Cleveland. It's great to see you in the building, and we appreciate what you do as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will move on to presentation number two. Tracy Eschenberg, Port Huron Schools, will present the district's Attendance Awareness Month informational campaign. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Rep, City Council, and Manager Freed for allowing me to have the opportunity to share with you a little bit about what Port Huron Schools has been doing uh, in order to bring awareness to really a community-wide issue regarding school attendance and the importance of having students in school. We like to use the analogy of a puzzle with 180 pieces. Each day is like a piece of that puzzle during the school year and each one is valuable. When you miss one or two pieces of a puzzle, you can still make out the general picture that is trying to be portrayed. But the more pieces you may be missing, just like the more days that a student may miss school, the fuzzier that picture becomes. And there becomes a point where you really just can't make out 
what that picture is. And so our goal as a school district is to ensure that students have the supports that are needed and families have what they need to really make sure students are getting to school every day, as many days as possible during that school year, all day. We know that nationally school attendance has a large impact on student achievement. And based on some information from the 2013-14 Civil Rights Data Collection, 14% of students enrolled in public schools missed 15 or more days of school in a, in a year. 20% of high school students in public schools across the country missed 15 or more days. That's a significant impact, especially at that high school level where the content is uh, faster paced and we're trying to prepare students to graduate ready for post-secondary education as well. Looking locally, we looked at last school year, the number of students that missed 25 or more school days during the year. And you'll see that we have about 10% of our K-12 population in Port Huron that missed 25 or more days of school. The most significant impact was at the middle school level where 15% of our middle school students missed that 25 or more days of school. And that really starts to make that picture of the puzzle quite blurry when you're missing that many days of school. Why does it matter? Well, we know that it, it matters not only for academic achievement, but in a lot of other ways as well. We want to maximize students' experiences in the classroom, and that is beyond just the content. That means relationships with their teachers and with their peers, learning how to get along with others and communicate with others and collaborate. And those things can't happen if a student is not in school. We also know that absenteeism contributes to a higher rate of high school dropout, which, uh, which impacts our workforce. Regular school attendance really develops those positive habits of a lifetime and benefits all of our employers in the future when they have employees that are coming with good attendance habits. And finally, when children have to miss school due to illness or other reasons, their parents are oftentimes staying home with them and missing work as well. Or if the parents are unable, some of our older students are staying home alone during the day and we know that they're missing out on some valuable experiences. Some of, those, some of the impact on students includes that missed opportunity, lack of continuity within the classroom, lower levels of academic achievement both in math and reading, higher failure rates in middle school and high school, and we know that that academic impact is even greater on our students that are coming from homes that are lower, lower socioeconomically. There's less likelihood and opportunity for them to make up the missed work and the missed opportunities from school. The district does have a process to address chronic absenteeism. One of the main things that we do is we look at the, from the positive end of things. Attendance is a behavior. Just like any other behavior, we need to teach our expectations. We need to recognize when our students are meeting those expectations, reward them for positive attendance and recognize that. We need to work hard at creating relationships between our teachers, our staff members, and our students and families so that students want to come to school every day. But when we do have a problem where we have a student that may be missing a significant number of days, we start with contacts by the teacher. We know that that teacher-student relationship is critical and that they know their, their students the best and that it's important that they're making contacts with the family to see what might be going on and how they might be able to help. Our principals get involved as well with sending letters or inviting families in to sit down and discuss what issues might be going on, what barriers might exist that they might need help with to improve their child's attendance in school. We, at times, uh, get to a point where we need to make a referral to our county truancy officer, uh, Mr. Terry Harrington with the St. Clair County RESA. And then he, too, will get involved and help to coordinate community services with the, the family to meet any needs that they might be having that are preventing them from getting their children to school regularly. And then if we are still seeing issues and we're not coming to a resolution, we do, at times, refer to the court system. That is never our intent. That's never our first step. But we do know that at times that does become a necessity. 
We've been working very hard this year, especially over the summer, with um, Mike McMillan and with Nathan Roski to look at how can we together with our St. Clair County RESA and our district and the uh, county system work together to improve student attendance and to make the system flow a little bit faster and not get bogged down in um, timelines that we might have a student come to 30 or 40 absences before we see something change and start to improve. So we're trying to fix our systems as well to make sure that we're getting the supports to families as quickly as possible when we notice that there is an issue. There are definitely ways that the community can help. And the first being participating in this public awareness campaign. September is National Attendance Awareness Month. But we don't want to stop at September. We want to make sure that this is a focus for us throughout the school year. So conveying that importance that every day counts and every day being a school all day. We have concerns over students that might come on a regular basis an hour late to school. They've missed an hour of learning or leave an hour early. And those, those minutes add up. Partner with schools to recognize and appreciate improved and good attendance. So it's another way that community members can get involved or the business community can become involved. We're always looking for ways to um, provide incentives and recognize the positive things our students are doing. We are also always looking for mentors. So uh, adults that would be willing to mentor a chronically absent student. Just another adult relationship that will uh, build for that student and share the importance of an education and being in school. Also working with parents, educating our parents on the importance of having their children in school every day and helping them to find resources that will help them improve their children's attendance, including proper medical care to reduce illness-related absences or other public services that may be inhibiting them from getting their children to school every day on time. We're looking for support from the medical community as well. Partnering with our schools and early childhood programs to ensure that children and families get access to health insurance and services that they need to address their health needs. <clears throat> Encouraging parents to schedule their routine appointments outside of the school day. Or if they do need to be during the school day, encouraging them to make sure that they bring their children to school afterwards or before the appointment rather than a 10 a.m. appointment and the student misses the entire day of school. We also hope to have our medical community help us educate families and students about that importance of school attendance and avoiding absences unless the child is truly ill and encouraging them to return to school as soon as possible when they're feeling better. <coughs> Finally, community members. This is a, something that impacts our entire community and I think we all can play a role in, in the solution as well. And that is supporting parents, guardians, and your neighborhood that might struggle getting their children to school on a regular basis. Ask how you can help. Sometimes it's just difficult. We all have uh, maybe had that experience of a child that doesn't quite want to get up in the morning and get going, or just maybe not feeling quite so well and is giving mom or dad a hard time about going to school, and it, and, and it gets challenging. And they need the support. Moms and dads need the support of their neighbors and friends and relatives to say, you can do this. And, and I can help you and support you in making sure that your children are getting to school. Also, we encourage any community members that want to get involved in our schools to volunteer to be a mentor. Students have strong relationships with adults, and we know that that impacts them wanting to be at school because they know that they've got something to look forward to, someone special that is looking forward to seeing them there on a regular basis. So again, I appreciate the opportunity to address the council and to share some ways that we can all get involved and help to improve our community one child at a time because we know that they are going to make the difference for our community in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now is the time for public comment. If there's anyone in the audience who wishes to address the City Council on any agenda item or other matter under the City's jurisdiction, you can come forward at this time, come to the podium, give us your name, and you have four minutes.
Hello, my name is Dennis. Um, okay, I'm very nervous. So. What is your last name, Dennis? Oh, Dennis Morosco. I'm a, I've been a resident of Port Huron for three and a half years now. Um, <clears throat> Morosco, that was M-R-O-S-K-O, it's a strange name. Um, so like I was saying, I'm, I'm very nervous, so please bear with me. I, I came to Port Huron from a treatment facility. Um, I never had heard of Port Huron besides seeing it on freeway signs, except other than the fact knowing that it was a place that I could have a new way of, that they could give me a new way of life. So I think unlike many of the other uh, people where they say if it wasn't for Port Huron, they, if it wasn't for the Port Huron recovery or three-quarter houses, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have made it. Well, I had my mind set that I was coming here no matter what. So even if a bed was not open, I was so desperate. I was so ready to change that I was coming to Port Huron because Port Huron sets the standard in recovery living today and with Vision Quest. I should say Vision Quest sets the standard and Port Huron is the city that sets the standard as well. Um, gener for, I've been looking over the uh, different items on these, on this, I'm not sure what this thing is called, but I'm looking over the different items and generally I, I feel like we're on the right, the right track. But there are a few things and I've been racking my brain a lot with, with some of these, and I think a lot of us are, when it comes to allowing certain residents in the house that have been convicted of certain crimes. And can I sit here and say, do I want, if a, if a three-quarter house was my neighbor, do I really want a person convicted of a serious crime just coming out of somewhere from Michigan to move in next to me? I have a four-month-old daughter. Um, I can tell you, no, I wouldn't. And that's very hard to say. But I'm also under the impression that I think that everyone does deserve a chance. So maybe not just a, maybe same in the same effect that we don't just allow someone who relapses, kick them out of the house. If they are convicted of that, give them the information they need to where they can find help. And then maybe after some probationary periods and, and, and some and, and, and some and five referrals or whatever that needs to come that needs to take place, maybe then allow them to come. But to just to shut up the door on anyone, to me, completely, it doesn't seem right. Because just based off of my history and the point of hopelessness where I was at, I was, in my opinion, weeks, maybe days, months from, from dying. I, I was. Um, my son's mother, in fact, did pass away five weeks after I got clean from an overdose. Um, I am eternally grateful for this city. I, I really am. This, the life I have today is, well, I always, I, I, right now I'm going to say it's amazing, but really it's not. It's kind of boring. I mean, I work every single day now, and, and, <laughs> and like I'm trying to do all these different things, and, and I'm, I'm having a rough time right now. But, you know, if it wasn't for the city and it wasn't for the recovery community in general, I don't know where I'd be. It, it's, it's amazing. Um, and then the, the two-third, the last part I want to talk about is the two-third uh, of the beds being um, reserved for um, St. Clair residents and then one third of them being from Port Huron. I do see a problem with that based off my experience with um, just w being involved and being here and, and seeing what I see. And th it seems like the people that are from Port Huron, and I, and I don't have the statistics, it's very hard to get the statistics, but um, it seems like the people that are from Port Huron that, that stay in Port Huron, there's so many triggers and so many temptations to, to, to to go and, and to do what they want to do, and it's so easy, it's right there. I would almost encourage a person from Port Huron to go to a different city, whereas I would encourage a person from maybe Macomb to come here. Um, but I also understand the same token where, where you guys are coming from. And Dennis, I'm sorry, but your four minutes set us up. Okay, thank okay. you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Good evening. My name is Jason Pittman. I'm a resident of Fort Gratiot but I spend the bulk of my days and my time right here in, in Port Huron as the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church on the corner of 8th and Wall in Old Town. Um, additionally, I'm a member of the Board of Directors at Operation Transformation here in town in Port Huron and a member of the leadership team of the Blue Water Area Churches Association. I currently serve as its president. As president of the Blue Water Area Churches Association, I want to address you all tonight uh, just as I addressed the, the Planning Commission last week regarding the, the recovery home housing ordinance before you. Recovery, uh, especially from the pains of addiction, it has become a, a, a strong, a, a, an unavoidable issue 
to our nation, and uh, Port Huron is not immune from that. We are unfortunately right on the front lines of the battle, uh, a battle of what is essentially for life and the need for hope, as Dennis mentioned, <coughs> hope. Blue Water Area Churches Association has taken up this issue of recovery and hope in our community because we believe that every one of us at our core is in recovery from something. And that is those who are created in the image of God. We are all meant for a life of hope, of health, of wholeness, of community, of reconciliation, of relationship, of peace, of joy. And we seek in whatever way we can to, to advocate for such a life and to advocate for our brothers and sisters in the recovery community. On behalf of the Blue Water Area Churches Association, I'm here to say that what we all want is what's best for our community and all of those who call it home. But it is our conviction that while this housing ordinance before us tonight may be legal, it, uh, we do not feel that it is moral. It is our view that certain language within it, specifically in paragraphs 5 and 6 regarding past convictions and residency requirements, that it further stigmatizes individuals in recovery and it will intentionally or otherwise create an oppressive, a prejudicial, a biased housing practice toward those seeking health and wholeness and recovery of their lives and their well-being here within our community. We feel that there may be yet a better way to go about ensuring wholeness and health than what this ordinance currently affords. And while the Commission spoke of it last week as being a living document that's capable of being amended as needed, we wish for this to be the best it can be rather than good enough for now. To put it bluntly, none of us is beyond redemption, and every one of us is meant for community, and this ordinance seems to imply otherwise toward those who are seeking to live a redeemed life in our community. Concerns such as those that were brought to bear last week at the Housing at the Planning Commission's uh, meeting, such as parking spaces and lawn care, these are not central to our aim, but the preservation of life and the protection of the dignity of life is an explicit goal. The wholeness of our community and the building up of both our neighbors and our neighborhoods is our goal. We kindly urge you to consider removing, at the very least, the wording of paragraph 5, sections B through D, and simplifying paragraph 6 to read, rather than such the strict requirements as they are currently, that priority will be given to St. Clair County and Port Huron residents. Deacon Dennis Cremens from Holy Trinity Catholic Parish and the chair of the Blue Water Area Churches Association's Recovery Task Force will speak further about our concerns. And I want to thank you for your time and for your dedication to seeking what's best for our community and pray that God would give you wisdom and courage as you deliberate and discern the legal and the moral way forward tonight and in the days ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Deacon Dennis Crimmins. I live at 7643 Galbraith Line Road in Lexington, Michigan. I minister at Holy Trinity Catholic Parish here in Port Huron. Our parish includes the geographic area known as Old Town and the St. Joseph Church. I'm here tonight representing the Recovery Task Force of the Blue Water Area Churches. I thank you for the privilege of speaking to you this evening. I remembered you all in prayer today. I know how difficult your job is. The ordinance you have before you is so important to our community, literally a matter of life and death. I ask the Lord to give you his wisdom as you deliberate. As a church community, we have come here tonight to speak against the sections of the proposed new ordinance that talk about the criminal background stipulations and the residency requirements for the people who will be allowed to reside in the recovery houses within the city limits. We believe that these sections are blatantly discriminatory against people seeking recovery. Other people who move to our city are not required to undergo, undergo a background check, and there are no quotas based on residency imposed on any other group. We believe that stigmatizing and shaming people in recovery in this way <coughs> will be detrimental to their return to health. If our intent as a community is to save lives and stop overdoses from occurring, we believe that we are addressing the issue of recovery homes in the wrong order. Currently, the recovery homes are providing our best hope for eradicating the opiate crisis. They are not drug houses. They are houses of recovery. 
They are not an institution we should fear or limit. They are actually an antidote already operating in our community. Supporting their work is our best hope of bringing healing in this crisis. We believe that a continuum of care should be our community's first priority, and the churches are committed to helping to establish it. A continuum of care would include a recovery center and a detox center. The recovery center would be a clearinghouse for all issues to do with recovery, information, referral, data tracking, and supervision of the recovery houses. A one-stop entity dealing with all the issues of addiction and recovery. The detox center would be available for those who relapse and want to immediately get back into care. This continuum would assist the recovery houses in providing a much better chance of success. With experience and data, in a few months we would have a much better idea of what an ordinance governing, governing the recovery houses should look like. In the meantime, recovery houses could be allowed to provide care as they had before um, the cease and desist order. We've been told that this ordinance is a first step, a step that stigmatizes and discriminates against this vulnerable population is a step we believe in the wrong direction. Again, at the very least, we ask that sections five, B, C, and D be removed. We ask that section six, six be amended to simply say uh, that priority placement will be given to residents of Port Huron. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you this evening. I want to leave you with the words that Moses spoke in Leviticus 19. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mis mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Jones, and I'm a resident of St. Quick, uh, a resident of Port Huron. Um, I wanted to address the, the ordinance for the recovery houses. I am a recovering addict in this community. Um, I have nine and a half months clean. I will have 10 months on the 5th of October. Um, I want to say that if it wasn't for these recovery houses, um, there wouldn't be recovery in this town. I I'm just going to be honest with you guys. These recovery houses and these recovery groups and everything that this recovery community is doing for us to this day is what's helping us. These, these, these recovery houses are not providing substance abuse treatment. They're providing a safe home for somebody to live. The, the, the residents are given certain guidelines. They have to go to two meetings a day. They have, to, they have a curfew. They aren't allowed to use. If they use in the house, they get kicked out. But what I'm, uh, what I'm worried about is right now you guys have a cease and desist order on all Vision Quest houses. Um, I know several people that would love to be in a Vision Quest house, myself included right now. Um, and, and the thing is, is, we can't get help at the moment because you guys have the cease and desist order on them. I don't feel that the zoning should matter as long as the residents are not being a problem to our community. They have not harmed anybody. So, and, and, and then as well as the section five B, C, and D with the stipulations of um, they have to be residents of St. Clair County and then they have to be residents of Port Huron. Um, I know so many people who have came here seeking help from other counties because they can't <coughs> recover in their own county because of all the triggers. I am born and raised here. I got my addiction here. I've stayed here. And I will sit here and honestly say I would love to see a, somebody from a different town come here and get clean than stay in their <coughs> town. The only reason I haven't left is because I can't. 67% of all DHS cases are because of their parents sub suffering from substance abuse. I'm a victim of that. My children were removed from me because I'm an addict. I couldn't care for my children. And if I would have known about recovery houses sooner, 
I could have gotten my children back sooner and wouldn't have lost all rights to my children. So before you guys make this ordinance stick and stay, I, I ask you to just take into consideration all the addicts that are out here trying to do the right thing, that, we're being, that, that are trying to actually get clean and live in a structured environment because that's what we need is structure. I'm asking you guys, just take that into consideration before you guys decide where we can be zoned or putting cease and desist orders. I feel that until this ordinance is finalized, I feel that all Vision Quest homes should be allowed to operate fully and still take in people that need their help. Because I, let's just face it, people are dying every day because they can't get the help they need. So thank you for your thank time. You. Thank you. My name is Kiera Searles, and I just wanted to make a statement in regards to the ordinance you guys have in place on the recovery homes. Um, it's kind of lengthy, so I'm going to read from my text. Um, it says, timing is everything. It's understood that ordinances are necessary. However, while the days pass, so are people's loved ones. <clears throat> it's understood that in order for anything to run effectively, there must be rules in place and guidelines that are meant to be followed. But what's also clear is that the city of Port Huron has become bombarded with an increase in drugs, causing the helpless to use more and living their everyday life with no support. We must stand up for the people in our community without judgment. These people are someone's mother, sister, and aunt, etc. These people are recovering addicts, and they didn't choose to become who they became. The lack of support did. Um, instead of cease and desist orders, we need to open more doors without discriminatory ordinances. Where they come from and their past criminal history should not matter. What matters most is them admitting that they have a problem and us being their fellow citizens should do more than cause more hurdles for them to jump. Um, as we recognize the youth in our city, we also need to recognize the want for change in our community. Treatment before ordinance. Um, no rules or regulations should stop someone who wants to make a change. We have plenty of <clears throat> empty buildings, and I think we just need to open our hearts and our minds and expand what Port Huron really stands for. We must take control of our city in a positive way. When you step away from the council table, you are human too. I just ask that you make decisions accordingly. Furthermore, my brother is a current addict and has been for almost three years, but doesn't qualify for any of the resources that we have in our community. <clears throat> um, and would have to jump hurdles like I referred to in order to get the proper help. Um, might I mention that I spent half my life visiting my mother when she was at Clearview. And if it wasn't for that place, my mom may not be clean today or living. These facilities matter and the lives that are being saved matter as well. Just as it takes a village to raise a child, it takes, a community, it takes community action to help raise the hopeless. That's all. Thank you. My name is Natalie <coughs> Barry Greer. I am now a Port Huron resident, but all these doors were closed because I am a felon and I'm a drug addict in recovery. These houses are very, very important to us. If it wasn't for the doors being closed and all these other places on me and the church doors opening to me because I had no place to go, because of this ordinance being put down, and I just got here in July. I've been through the ruck of the dark side of the world, and now I came to Port Huron and I have peace within myself. And if it wasn't for Port Huron being here, these recovery houses are very, very, very important because it shows structure in our lives that we didn't have growing up. As they said about the schools and the absences, we need to have people that are absent in our recovery homes because we're going to wind up dying on these streets if they're not open to felons and recovering addicts of all creeds, races, and sexual identity. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Carol Booth. I live at 817 Ontario Street in Port Huron. Um, I moved to Port Huron from Flint, Michigan about three years ago, and um, when I got clean, I knew that I could not go back to the streets of Flint. I couldn't make it there. I didn't have the necessary tools to stay clean where I was born and raised, so I decided to relocate to Port Huron. If three quarter houses had not been open for me to stay there to get a chance at a fresh start, I probably wouldn't have gotten clean when I did. And I probably would have been one of the statistics and my family would have probably buried me. Um, I have relapsed a couple times since I got clean almost three years ago. Um, it had nothing to do with anything about three quarter houses or anything. It was a lack of my will to stay clean at the time. Um, but coming from where I was three years ago to where I am now, um, I'm a totally different person and I do know as a living proof that people can change. Um, I do not have any felonies, that is one thing that I'm grateful for. I did not get there in my addiction, but I do have many friends in recovery that have felonies. And a lot of these young ladies that I am very close to need three quarter houses because they cannot maintain stability on their own feet. Um, a couple of the three-quarter houses are at risk of being closed down in, in their entirety because most of their residents are either not residents of Port Huron or they have felons that are on the list of crimes that are no longer allowed to be in three-quarter houses. Um, as many people have stated, um, the recovery population, we, stay, we face a stigma every day that we get up and we face a generalized normal society of people that don't use. Um, we're not statistics. Um, every day that we wake up clean is a miracle. Um, every day people are losing loved ones and without the resources like three quarter houses being available to people without looking at what they've possibly done in their past, the stigma is just going to keep going and more deaths are just going to keep occurring if the help is not available. Instead of being stigmatized and discriminating against towards what we've done in our past. We need to be uplifted and empowered towards what we can do in the future without drugs in our lives. Thank you for letting me address you guys. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ann Parway and I live at 1234 Mini. And I'm a woman in recovery, long-term recovery. I also manage and reside in the Woman's Vision Quest Recovery Home. I'm from Macomb County. Had I not had the opportunity to recover in Port Huron, I would not be able to accomplish what I have accomplished in recovery. The fact that I was unable to do that in my hometown was a huge factor. Most of the people that are in recovery are from other communities. And I am a grandmother, a mother, a daughter, and a sister. And so are all the people that are in these Vision Quest recovery homes. I was given a second chance, and I believe that anybody should be treated as equal to have that second chance. These are lives, you know. When I pay my phone bill, I pay it one time. If I'm late, they don't come back at me and try and make me pay it again. They give me the opportunity and, and I move forward and I don't make that mistake again. When somebody pays their debt, it's paid. They deserve a second chance. I was given a second chance. I'm a woman in long-term recovery. Thank you. Thank you. This microphone was set for Jason Pittman, not for me. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Honorable Council. My name is Pat Thompson. 
<clears throat> I'm the new kid on the block. I'm the new pastor at Sturgis Memorial Congregational Church at 2729 Ravenswood Road. I, too, rise in opposition to parts of this ordinance, if not all of it. As I read the Bible, and as I tell my people every Sunday, as has been referred to here this afternoon, we preach a word of hope. We recognize in the Reformed tradition that I come from that God, in fact, redeems all of us and gives to all of us chance after chance after chance. We embrace the goodness, the compassion, the sovereignty of God in all the ways that that manifests itself. And as I read the Bible, it seems to me that one of the overarching themes that runs from the Old Testament right through the New is this notion of empire versus human considerations. Certainly there is a valid reason for us to have laws and regulations. Certain things have to be regulated. We have to have city councils and courts and legislatures and all of those things. But at the same time, we cannot lose sight of the humanity of what it is we try to accomplish. And I know that every one of you here tonight is trying to do the right thing, but I'm here to tell you this is not it. There are some fatal flaws in this ordinance. Paragraphs 5 and 6 have been cited earlier, and the concerns that those are about certainly need to be addressed at a minimum. But beyond that, it seems to me that this ordinance is so comprehensive that it tries to do so much that it borders on being unreasonable. We believe that we need to do something, certainly, about the opiate crisis in our community. No question about that. People are dying every day, but I'm, I'm here to tell you that if we enact, if you enact this ordinance in a couple of weeks, people will die. Make no mistake about that. People will die. You have the opportunity to do the right thing. And I hope that God will give you the wisdom beyond simply a knee-jerk concern about doing something quickly now because you know, we all know about that proverbial slippery slope. If we enact the legislation now and hope to, let, to uh, amend it somewhere down the road, well, good luck. You and I, all, we all know how that works. I wish you God's peace. I wish you a sense of wisdom. I hope you will get in touch in a profound way this night with your humanity. The fact that we all wear the same human skin. And as G.K. Chesterton once said, we're all in this boat together on a storm-tossed sea. And we owe to each other a terrible loyalty. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Honorable Council. Uh, I am here again. I am Trey Smith, and I'm the pastor of Faith Christian Community Church. And I just wanted to bring a few things up. Uh, when I was at the Planning Commission meeting, I was listening to the dialogue that was going on, and uh, two things really stuck out to me. Number one, the commission seemed really unsure about the full meaning of what it meant to actually put together this ordinance and put it in place. But I continue to hear... Uh, the pressure and the push to, we need to do something. This was the idea, we just can't do anything. Uh, they asked for, is there any other examples throughout the state that can be put in place or anything that we can review? And uh, that was to be considered. But then one thing that I heard that was really striking to me that made it hard to sleep at night, I heard that if the ordinance didn't pass, there would be an all-out attack to make sure that all recovery homes would be shut down. And so that brought anger to me. I was upset. As a pastor, my job is to make sure that I help people no matter what their place is in life. And I uh, had the opportunity to congratulate our councilperson, Archibald, being put in a great position to help with ch uh, child abuse and neglect counsel. And I'm looking forward to a great work with our children because 67% of our children are being removed because of substance abuse. So that's going to be something that they're going to have to contend with. But I was then convicted in my heart. I was asked by God through something that I heard at one of the first council meetings that we had to deal with this issue, right? The first thing was, what's most important for our community? 
And again, our city manager told us the preservation of life. And that's what I'm concerned about. And so this is something I want you to consider. Let's say we pass this ordinance as it is. You regulate the homes, one third, two third, or actually one third, one third, one third, right? What will pastors do that are convicted about the same thing, the preservation of life? They may now buy homes themselves. They may put people in these homes. Their churches, their basements will be now recovery centers. Anybody who's convicted about the preservation of life will take somebody, like today, I got a call to take a recovering addict to the pregnancy care center. Did I care about where they were from? No, because I care about the preservation of life. Every now and then, we have to ask ourselves, what does our conviction tell us to do? At the end of the day, truth be told, you can pass this or not, but we're going to do what's necessary to preserve life. It's the only reason why churches are around. It's the only reason why we have a job, and it's the only reason why God graces us. And in all due respect, truth be told, I am not against you all in any way, shape, form, or fashion. I have the utmost respect for your position because I don't want it. But the one thing that I really want, just to be clear on, is how is our efforts, our time, our money, our intentions going to truly preserve life? Not in theory, because theories will not save anybody. What saves lives is taking somebody off the street and saying, I'm going to help you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to show you a better way. Like I said, I don't have an answer to this. I ain't a lawyer, don't want to be, don't need to be. But I do know what a bleeding person looks like. And I'm not going to consult the medical code to see if I should stop them from bleeding. And my encouragement is please do everything you can to stop this community from bleeding. Because it rests in your hands. But if it doesn't happen here, it's, we are obligated to do everything we can to stop it by any means necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Esteemed friends and guardians of our city, Mayor Rep, and council members, um, thank you for the time and effort that you've put not only into helping the city, but the recovery community as well. I Would do you want you to know. Restate oh, your name. Just my so name is Sharon Mikesell, and I am a resident of Port Huron. Thank you. Um, I'm also a long-term recovery person. Um, I would like you to know that I can see and appreciate the great effort that's gone into the formulation of this, this ordinance. There are a lot of good things in it. Um, I would like to speak to Section 6 myself. Uh, I understand that this is probably an attempt to take care of our own because we have so many people here that need recovery. And I was trying to picture that. And I want to make sure that we do this fairly, um, that I'm treated the same way as you're treated and another person on the, tree, on the street. Um, we're opening the doors of our town more and more to different people. We're opening to college students by creating dorms for them to live here, an awesome idea. However, let's make sure we remember that there's been many a death on campus from drinking and partying. So I think perhaps if we're gonna impose this rule on people in recovery, then we should also do that with our campuses too. Um, only one in three of those beds should be filled by someone from outside of this town or area. Be sure that we don't have any kind of a past record for anyone because God forbid you should go back to school and have a record. Um, what about people in the real estate business? Can they only sell one in three homes to people from outside of this county? Investors, you know, only one in three can come from outside of the area. Um, don't have a record either, please. We won't sell them our land. We won't let them invest in our community or eat a meal here because they're from outside of our beloved county and town. Let's only entertain bids from people who live in the area and have clean records. I want to take a ride on the Huron Lady, bring a few friends, especially people from out of town. Um, only one from outside of the county for every two people that are taking up a seat on the Huron Lady. Same thing in our, in our restaurants. Don't plan on bringing more than one friend because we only invite one out of three seats to people outside of the county. Um, it says that there's these people outside of that one in three are non-qualifying individuals, so we want to make sure they're qualified. At what point in time does this start to be ridiculous? Usually it's at the point that affects one of us, our family members, people we care about. 
Do we plan on letting beds stay open to go along with an ordinance because people don't come from the right place? Most of the people I've worked with in the last 13 years and nine months don't come from the right place. That's why we come to recovery. Why section off a part, why, not, why don't we go ahead and section off a part of town for people who, li- who come from outside of the area? That way we know that we only have that one-third set up. Matter of fact, what we might do is just, you know, have a way that we can know who comes from outside of town. You know, they used to do that. They had a, they had a way of telling where you're from, what your beliefs are, and such like that. I, I think it was a gold star that went on people's clothing. Each one of us have had times when we've been judged and pushed away or told we can't go somewhere. A lot of the people in this room that have stood up very bravely need to be able to have a place they can go. Port Huron has given recovery to a lot of people, and I'm hoping we can continue to do that. Because of the work that you're doing, though, I want you to know that people are coming together. I was in two different uh, groups this week, and and there are all kinds of people that are coming together to help the recovery community. And I am very grateful for each of you. Can somebody help her? Oops. You got her? Anyways, that's it. Thank you, family. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mary Williams. And you guys are faced with a, um, an opportunity to do the right thing, or you can become the pallbearers, maybe the honorary pallbearers of the people who will lose their life because of addiction and having no place to go and to seek adequate treatment. All I have to say about myself But for the grace of God, there go I. There go I. Thank you. My name is Chris Wiegand, um, brand new resident of the city of Port Huron. Just moved into 1412 21st Street. Uh, Been a uh, resident of St. Clair County for over 20 years. Uh, Also a pastor. Pastor Livingstone Church. Uh, we now meet at the old Guadalupe building. And I, I don't think I can add anything to uh, what uh, my pastoral colleagues have already stated. Um, I didn't even prepare words because I just came to support uh, the statements that they had drafted. Um, but I, in sitting here, I realized I did have something to contribute, um, and I, I need to take that opportunity now. Um, in 19, October 3rd, 1988, I was 16 years old, and I was an out-of-control teenage uh, drunk, um, abused alcohol and drugs, and my parents um, put me in a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center. I realized as I was listening to members of the recovery community come forward and began to give their story um, Something that I had is something that a great many people don't, and that was a supportive family. Uh, I really believe that I am where I am today because I had a supportive family. And I was thinking about the words that uh, Pastor Jason Pittman said at the beginning. Um, What is really needed is a community. And the recovery community, um, if they are being asked to... uh, withhold uh, people who have records. Um, I, I, at 16 years old, I was a minor, so, but I, if I would have done, had been, I could have been convicted as, if I would have done the things that I did um, as an adult later in life, but thankfully all that is on my juvenile record now. Um, But by the grace of God, I I was able to um, not only get clean at the time. Um, I've been married for over 21 years. Um, I've been, I've had the same job at Chrysler for 18 years now. Uh, five children who are rapidly leaving home. Um, and uh, yeah, just a beautiful, messy story it is. But 
Um, the uh, I, I just felt grieved in my heart that so many people that are trying to recover that don't have that supportive family that I had, they need a supportive community. And that's what I hope um, we will be. And I know the church community wants to be that, but we are asking the city council to uh, remove the the parts of the ordinance that discriminate and that um, really put a roadblock for many um, to achieving sobriety. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Christopher Cook, and my address is 1438 Washington. I wasn't born in Port Huron, but my family goes back here for at least a thousand years. I'm native, I'm Aboriginal. And we had treaty rights over on this side of the river too, if you're familiar with the Michigan National Bank up there. I found my addiction here. I also found my recovery here. I've struggled. You know, I'm not exactly the person you would invite over for Sunday dinner. And I'll be honest with you, the gentleman in blue there, I was probably guest in his facility when it used to be right over across the street next to the courthouse. I've been not exactly the nicest human being in the world. But I found recovery here. And I found it from people who were kicked out of VQ. They were staying in the homeless shelter. They told me I didn't have to live like this anymore that there was a way that I could find recovery, that I could get out of it. I, was, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I was happy to be living in the home shelter, eating in a soup kitchen. I thought my life was good. That's how bad my addiction was until they pointed out the fact that, hey, you're in a homeless shelter eating in a soup kitchen. And I thank God it was there. That's how askewed the drugs had made my life, you know? I detoxed in jail, and from jail, I went up here to the local hospital, and they had this thing that they called kind of catch and release when you're not quite in control of your facilities because of the drugs and the withdrawal. And I stayed there for a week until I could kind of catch my breath. From there, I bounced to the homeless shelter. And it happened to be a couple of kids that got kicked out of VQ just for being stupid. But the thing of it is, is that they pointed me into recovery, into NA, into AA, and told me what the program was. And the thing of it is, is it's fortunate, because had it not been brought to my attention that there was a way out of this addiction, I would still be doing what I was doing. And the thing of it is, this has just started with a little pill from my doctor. You know, a little thing to manage some pain because I had broken my back. You know, I've had multiple surgeries. That's how bad it got. But the thing of it is, is without VQ being here and having standards and a working program, I wasn't able to find a program for myself to work. And with it shut down like that, who knows how many people that are from here, that are born here, that didn't get that message, you know? I don't know how many times it may have came into my life, but I was receptive at that point. I was teachable. I had found my bottom, you know? There wasn't a whole hell of a lot left for me to do except for die. So I thank God for VQ, though I've never stayed there because I was unemployable for health reasons, for criminal reasons, for a lot of reasons. But by picking and choosing who can come and who can stay, it was one time my house backed up with sewage. My neighbor had done something and broken a pipe or something like that, and he came into my basement. When I went to the local days in down the road here, they didn't care where I was from. Christopher, your four minutes is up. But they, they took me, and I don't think we should put, you know, any 
reasons, you know. As long as they're looking for recovery, Port Huron is the place to come. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Chubahowski, Port Huron, Michigan. And, and I understand the, the fears that everybody have. I lost a cousin to drug addiction. But my fear is, as a resident of Port Huron, is people looking at this as a window of opportunity and become opportunist with seeing the problem. And we need to make sure that if we have recovery homes, that they're done properly, they're data driven, and they're done right. So when people do leave, they do have success. That's all I have. Thank you. Hello, my name is Latoya Lewis. I am a new resident to Port Huron. What was your first name? I'm sorry. Latoya, L-A-T-O-Y-A. Um, I am a new resident to Port Huron. And um, I come from addiction, being my entire family, even myself. Um, I came to Port Huron in June when my sister overdosed from heroin. She tried to get into a rehab facility, and they told her that there were no beds, that they could not accept any new patients. And two days later, she was standing at her kitchen sink from a heroin overdose. Um, that made me change my life. I have now I have 95 days clean. I'm working at a very good job. I'm trying to get my life back on track and I'm there for my family. But if we deny help, how many more brothers and sisters and uncles and grandmas are we gonna lose to heroin or any other drug for that matter? These people, us people, we need help and we need the, the support from people because some of us don't have family. I no longer have family because all of my family have been wiped out from drug abuse. So I'm the last, me and my grandfather. We are the last and we need the help. We need somebody to fight for us if don't nobody else fight for us because some of us can't fight any longer. Some people are tired of fighting and they need help, but that's it. try to be as quick as possible um, and I apologize um, this is a, a, a little weird for me um, my name is Bobby Jones jr. Um, I uh, grew up on the corner of 28th and Nern and the reason I met this council meeting was support to support uh, Miss Williams uh, the NAACP um, and just the wonderful work that that she did with the the youth in helping the, the, in the presentation with the, the reading program. Um, as I was sitting there, um, hearing everyone come up, I, I had a fight with God uh, because sometimes God puts uh, uh, words in me that I don't want to say. And he convicts me to get up and speak. Um, I didn't want to get up and come up here. And I'm fighting it and, and texting my wife saying, uh, come get me, because uh, she dropped me off. I'm ready to go, because uh, if not, I'm going to get up and, and uh, hopefully not make a, a, a spectacle. Um, but no, no disrespect to the council, I really wanted to address uh, the individuals in the audience um, who's coming up to... Uh, you still uh, need to address us. You, can, sorry, you yes. can say it in, yes. in reference to them, but it is um, public comment to us, yes, not to the audience. Yes, public comment to the, that. I, I respect... Um, their ability to come up. Um, I respect their conviction and their desire to improve their life. And I think that's their main goal is to improve their life. I don't know a lot about this ordinance, but I will. Um, I will I will research it. Um, I don't know what problem this ordinance is supposed to fix. Because normally if you, you present an ordinance, it's to resolve some type of issue. Um, I haven't heard what issue uh, uh, yet today that ordinance is supposed to address, um, but I am curious to, to, to learn it. Um, but we as a, a nation um, was founded on the ability uh, to speak our mind, to, to protest, to make, uh, uh, to communicate that we don't agree with what you're doing. Um, and I, I just want to give them the respect that they, they took this forum um, that was designed for that, that manner to come up and address 
uh, what they think isn't right. Um, so I do give them uh, respect, and, and, and um, I think that is very honorable of them for doing that. Uh, again, since I don't know a lot about the ordinance, I, 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 I will be ending quickly. Um, but I, when coming from a business environment, um, I, I work in pharmaceutical um, computers uh, in the pharmacies, and, and I'm in a pharmacy uh, every week. And unfortunately, I see um, sides of, of this addiction um, that most don't. Um, I see uh, the, the drug addict sticking up the pharmacy. Um, I see uh, when I uh, pull up or open a drawer to uh, get a vial to test something, I see a, a 45. And I wonder, why do you have uh, uh, weapons in, in the pharmacy? Um, it's because of uh, this addiction that's just plaguing the country, uh, not just Port Huron. Uh, and we all see it, and we all have opportunities to do one of two things, to uh, throw your hands up and say there's nothing I can do, or do, even if it's the smallest thing, something you can do to address that. Again, not knowing the particulars of the ordinance, I can't say uh, that it's right or wrong. I have no opinion on it. But if, you, if we do have the opportunity to make it better for someone else, um, I think we should take that opportunity. Your four minutes is up. Thank but you. just so you know, if you do stay till the end of the meeting, the ordinance is on there and it will be thoroughly discussed at that time so you get more details on it. Excellent. Thank okay. you. Is there anyone else? My name is Ariel Elkins. Um, I reside here in Port Huron, Michigan. I'm also here to make a statement on the ordinance of the recovery houses. My life has been extremely affected by drugs, not by personal use, but others around me, family members, friends. I'm 19 years old, so I'm at the, the age where we're finding our way, and a lot of us are losing our way. And I lost a best friend the 1st of January to drugs. And it's, it's really hard because a lot of my peers feel that they're alienated by our community for to come for help, I guess I would put it. And I feel like closing the doors is going to make them feel even more alienated and separated from our community. And I feel that as brothers and sisters, we should all come together instead of tear each other down and apart. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council Member, City Manager Freed. My name is William Brown. I live at 1719 Mini Street in Port Huron. I'm also in my 40th year of recovery. Um, the things that I wanted to talk about was the fact that I don't agree at all with the two-thirds, one-third portion of this or the, the uh, restrictions on people's convictions. Uh, I believe that this, as it's written now, is xenophobic and discriminatory. And as a taxpaying member of the city of Port Huron, I would uh, try to draw your attention to other cities that have done this in the past and I'm particularly interested in uh, what I read about the city of Newport Beach, California. Had, it cost them five, nine and a half million dollars, four and a half million dollars, attempting to uh, protect an ordinance of this nature and a five million dollar settlement. Also, uh, I wanted to talk about the fact that uh, I did some research again this week about Vision Quest. I'm not a, an employee of Vision Quest. I am in recovery and I've done a lot of voluntary work at Vision Quest. There are 20 to 25 beds still empty in the Vision Quest facilities. And in my opinion, that is denying 20 to 25 people the opportunity for recovery. And I would ask you, I beg you, to change this ordinance. Uh, I believe that if we gave uh, St. Clair County and Port Huron residents priority and that beds were set aside specifically for them, this would achieve the, the things that we need to do for this city. Thank you for putting up with me for all of these times. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dick Hodgkin. Uh, Pastor Dick, I serve 
St. John's United Church of Christ. I live in Old Town on the alley between, on 7th, between uh, Wall Street and Pine Street. Let me tell you a little something that happens when you have categories. We have a young woman who grows up, goes to the school here in Port Huron, gets a scholarship, moves out of state, gets her degree, finds a job in that community, moves in, things are going fine until she breaks a leg, gets a pain medication, Six months later, she's lost this wonderful job she has. She's lost her boyfriend. She's lost everything else. She's addicted. Don't you think her family would want her to come back to Port Huron? Her dad works for Mueller. Her mom works for the school district. Don't you think they want to nurture her here, nurture her and bring her back home? Guess what? She's not a resident of Port Huron. She's not a resident of... St. Clair County. There's empty beds, but she can't go in. Unintended consequence, collateral damage. This is the real world, folks. When you categorize people, you end up with throwaways. You don't have to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes? (laughs) (laughs) Mayor up, City Council, see Major Freed. Uh, Chief Baker can't be here tonight, but I was asked to uh, attend and give you an update about a recent award that we just received on Saturday. So on Saturday, I attended a luncheon in Grand Blank Township that was uh, put on by the Neighborhood Associations of Michigan because the Port Huron Police Department was nominated for an award. During that luncheon, the Port Huron Police Department received the 2017 Neighborhood mm-hmm. Associations of Michigan Audrey Martini Community Oriented Policing Award, mm-hmm. which I have here. So oh, take a look. This award was presented to members of the Port Huron Police Department for their involvement and efforts in the community-oriented policing for their community policing zones, working with the citizens of Port Huron to solve crimes, making the city of Port Huron a place for safe to work and live, and the reduction of violent crime since 2012. It was nice to be at this lunch and we heard a lot of good accolades about our members of the police department and what they've been doing in the city of Port Huron. So on the, on the behalf of uh, Chief Baker and the members of the Port Huron Police Department, I did accept that award and brought it here this evening. Um, today I sent out some information to our staff about the award. <clears throat> and what I told them was it was nice hearing that your efforts are not only being recognized by the citizens of Port Huron and city staff, but throughout the state of Michigan by this agency. So I just want to bring this award, let you know that we will be proudly displaying it in the city of uh, Port Huron Police Department. And uh, it was quite an honor to receive that. Thank you, and congratulations. Madam Mayor, the information he forwarded out to the uh, department today was also forwarded to you this afternoon, so you should have that in your inbox. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the council this evening? Sharon Bender, South Boulevard, Port Huron, resident since 1981. And I am here as a member of the Planning Commission to say why I did not vote for this ordinance. For the reasons that have already been stated, and because I believe we are going down a slippery slope when we are doing so much to legislate people's behaviors in their homes and businesses. This is happening as far as what we are doing in in terms of the rental portions of preventing people from being able to rent their homes if they want to set up a situation where one family member comes in maybe while the other one is going down south or whatever. 
I think we are going down a slippery slope in several instances with what we're doing with our ordinance. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. We have a way now to, well, let me ask this question. How many of the city council people attended any of the sessions, the informative sessions that the sheriff's department put on prior to that millage? How many attended? What I millage? Did. I did. That the sheriff's department put on? Yeah, the, before the, that vote, before the, the vote to, to increase the um, amount of money that the sheriff's department got for, for enforcement. For the drug task force? Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Yes. Did anyone attend? We all had yeah. a meeting. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I did also. I see this, this so, the sober homes as another, another part of trying to remedy our, our cities of the drug problem. We, when you see a person, any person, whether they're driving, whether they're, you're encountering them wherever, you have no idea what kind of drug situation they might be experiencing. I don't know if anyone read the book um, American Sniper by Chris Kyle. He talks about the fact that he almost became an addict because of the medicine that he was given. He had to immediately change it. I've had that experience. I was in an automobile accident in the 90s, and the, the medication that they were giving me, I, I had to read what the indications were to find out what, and I decided I would take the pain. I see that these homes are another way to help our police department, our sheriff's department, our state departments, our uh, drug task force people to combat this problem. And it's not just a problem of people who are doing bad. It's a problem of people who are not paying attention to what, what the ramifications are of combining this and this. So I'm asking you to reconsider doing this at this point in time until you've studied it further. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to address the city council this evening? Seeing no one, I'll declare public comment closed. We will move on with the agenda, and we have the consent agenda next. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Councilmember Archibald. Is there a second? Support. Mayor Pro Tem Ashford. Uh, Mayor Rep. Yes, Councilmember Warden. Uh, resolution. Um, 17-109, like to have removed uh, from the consent agenda. Okay. We will take the vote on the rest of the items. Councilmember Archibald? Yes. Councilmember Ashford? Yes. Councilmember Harris? Yes. Councilmember Lamb? Yes. Councilmember Ruiz? Yes. Councilmember Warden? Yes. Mayor Rep. Yes, items that were approved under the consent agenda, confirming and approving single lot special assessments for fines, assessments, and or cost of removing blight, blighting factors, and or causes of blight, as well as abatement of nuisances. Confirm the mayor's reappointment of Edward Brennan and Jamie Kane to the Tax Increment Finance Authority with terms to expire September 14, 2021. Second reading and enactment of an ordinance to, for the purpose of rezoning property described as 1602 Lapeer Avenue and 700 vacant lot 16th Street from C1 zoning, which is general business district, to R1 zoning district, single and two family residential district. And uh, also to give the second reading and enactment for an ordinance to amend Chapter 42 Street sidewalks and other public places. Uh, regarding the width and location for the purposes of allowing an existing sidewalk less than five feet in width to be replaced with a sidewalk of similar width. Those are all the items under the consent agenda. <clears throat> we will then move to from the city manager item number one. Is accepting the quote from Apollo Fire Equipment Company in the amount of $25,500 to purchase battery powered Jaws of Life extrication tools. Is there a motion? So moved. Mayor Pro Tem Ashford, is there a second? Second. Councilmember Archibald, is there discussion? 
Yes. Go ahead. No, go ahead. It's go fight over it. No, Councilmember Harris, I'll go with him first. Go with him. <laughs> Mayor Rep, could we get somebody to explain whether, how often we use, how often we use a JAWS life and, and how much better this will be than our current model? Chief Main Guy? Fire Chief Main Guy. Well, <laughs> I, think, I think we figured that out. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, uh, Mayor Rep, Council, Manager Freed. To answer your question, Councilmember Harris, we have in the city of Port Huron anywhere between six and nine vehicle extrications a year, which doesn't seem like a, a lot of times, but when we have them, uh, we need the tools because they're generally uh, an, a very damaging impact because we don't have a lot of high speed streets in the city, but it's contact with solid objects, trees, buildings, poles, things of that nature, where we do need them. Um, how these tools will benefit us um, is that they're going to be outfitted on the new pumping apparatus that you previously approved and that we take delivery on at the end of this year. Uh, going with a battery powered tool saves us the expense of having to outfit that engine with a hydraulic generator uh, onboard generator that powers uh, the older style tools. It also limits those tools that are hydraulic that have to be tethered to either a compressor or to the pumper. These being battery operated allow us the versatility to take them further away from an apparatus or into a building uh, and <clears throat> gives us more versatility that it frees them up. They also have the capability of cutting the new high strength steel that are in most of our auto automobiles now where the older models don't. Uh, and they, they are substantially less in cost uh, from a conventional hydraulic set. I do have a slide up uh, just so you can visualize. They're not like a DeWalt type power tool. They are designed especially to um, be used for vehicle extrications. Uh, cutters on your left and the spreading, conventional spreading units on your right. Um, they're a lot lighter and, and easier to be operated by uh, the fewer staff that we have on duty. So for all of these reasons, I, I recommend this to you also that these are demo tools, uh, demonstrator models uh, that were used by the sales vendor alone. They have a 10-year warranty. They're about six months old, so we still have about nine and a half years of warranty left on these tools, making them a great economic value for the, for the city. One last question. Do, yes, we, do we get a replacement battery with them? The, we do. They come with two <laughs> batteries, and they also have uh, the capability uh, that you Charge. need to understand that if the battery doesn't accomplish the extrication, they do come the, with a converter uh, tool that we can plug into our onboard power on the trucks and continue the evolution even if we should lose both batteries. But well, yes. the lithium ion tools are, 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 are beyond hydraulic, the old fashioned hydraulic tools. And I, I just think it's, it's impressive that we're getting the backup, the backup tool and the battery with it. So I'll be voting yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, Councilman, that was one of my questions, uh, the opportunity for usage. But I think in, in this case, it probably fits more in the category of having the right tools to do the job and do it that much more effective. Uh, and, and then also, to your point, I, I like the fact that we have nine and a half a year warning, warranty on this tool. Is that that's Absolutely proper? right. Oh. They come new from the manufacturer with 10 years. Uh -huh. Uh, the vendor indicated these particular tools are about six months old, so we have nine and a half years of, of warranty on these. Yeah, sure. Okay, and Chief, uh, last question, Mayor. So, Chief, what, uh, what, what, what are we using currently? What were we currently, using? we have uh, two sets, older sets, in excess of 10, 10 years, one set, the other set's about 15 years, of a hydraulic jaws of life. Okay. They're quality tools. They do the job. They're, they're not as efficient as these, and they do have the limited cutting capabilities that have been designed into these battery power tools. But we do have jaws. This will still allow us to have two sets. We'll replace the oldest set with these that are much heavier and, and more limited in their use. So. Okay, so, they, so all of them will still be in use. They will all be in service. Okay. We'll have a minimum of two sets of jaws in service in the city, yes. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mayor Rep. Any other questions? Uh, Madam Mayor. Councilmember <clears throat> Warden. Um, just, we, already, we have two of the other versions, and this is a third one. Are these going to be able to be at each of the three 
uh, fire stations? Is that the, these will be outfitted at our central fire station on the new pumper, which will cover all ends of the city, uh -huh. and the backup set generally is is an internal decision. We generally have them at the north end of town, but that's subject to change depending on the but apparatus. They both could there. arrive on scene if needed. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take the vote. Councilmember Ashford? Yes. Councilmember Harris? Yes. Councilmember Lamb? Yes. Councilmember Ruiz? Yes. Councilmember Warden? Yes. Councilmember Archibald? Yes. Mayor Rep? Yes. Uh, number two. Is accepting the quote of BOS structures and events in the amount of $17,433 for the Chili Fest 2018 tent rental and authorizing any entertainment agreements or pass through activities exceeding the pass the exceeding the purchasing threshold as long as sufficient funding is anticipated or committed. Is there a motion? So moved. Councilmember Archibald, is there a second? Second. Councilmember Lamb. Um, could we perhaps? Madam Mayor, this is a very similar to the agreement you guys do for Rock on the River. Um, I have uh, Natalie Watson, our downtown development director, and Nancy Windsor here if you have any additional questions or want to know about the event as well. It would be nice to hear about the event. Then maybe if anybody has any questions. Natalie, why don't you come on up too? Yeah. Excellent. Because in actuality, this is the same MO as all the ones we have. It's just formality that we're having. So it's a good point to hear about the event. Mayor up in, in City Council, unfortunately, there's no details on the event oh. yet because Do you have the date? too excited. Yeah. It's going to be the last, <laughs> okay. last weekend in January. Okay. And we're very excited to have Natalie um, head this up this year, our DDA director. Well, I'll be around her cheering her on. But um, obviously, like James said, the the um, the event is similar to Rock and the Rivers. It really dictates on how much money we raise. Unfortunately, with the tent rental, it's a very busy um, winter festival time, and it's very difficult to find a place that rents in the winter and does not um, stake into our asphalt because then I have engineering on me so it's a very uh, <laughs> see Lenny back there um, but um, it's a very difficult thing to find the size tent we need on the date and so that's why unfortunately there's not a lot of uh, competitors for it but we do with that I just want to let you know we we make sure we raise enough funds last year we raised 55,000 for this event and Natalie will probably raise you more because she's way better than me. And, oh. and uh, probably as we get closer, she'll have much more details in January to come bring to you guys. So. And just for the council's information, this was an event that Main Street was running for several years that McMorrin and the DDA have taken over and kind of breathed new life in it. And Natalie's kind of taken it to the next level with the promotion of Fourth Fridays leading up to Chili Fest. So it's nice. Uh, she's doing an excellent job. It's a two-day event, isn't it? Is it a two-day event? Yeah. Well, we'll look forward to hearing the details of whether they're put together, <laughs> <Sure>. okay? <laughs> yes, Councilmember okay. Harris. Uh, why, the decision, why the decision to separate this from Silver Stick? I think Silver Stick has kind of been an integral part of it, and in my understanding, we've, we've kind of gone away from that. I'm just kind of concerned that uh, we might spoil, this, spoil the success of the past uh, Chili Fest. Well, if you could have been in our office, it went back and forth for many hours as to what we should or shouldn't do. We spoke to Chili. Sometimes you get in this box, right? This has always been the last weekend in January, and Chili Fest or in uh, Silver Stick has backed up a week. We've spoken to them. We're going to do something on their weekend, but we're just a little bit nervous about taking it off the weekend it's always been because sometimes with events, there's many people that come here from out of town and Silver Stick, but they are used to the event being the last weekend in January, and so it's difficult to move your event. I'll get back to you as to what the but I have a feeling Silver Stick will move back. You know, it just depends. We just want to keep our event on the same weekend every year, so that's why it was a great debate there for many hours. But you should have called in the ref ref uh, back up. Uh, back up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're gonna, we think this will be helpful for the I, I hope it's successful to establish but, but their same always, weekend always every been time. Part of it, so thank yeah. you yep anything else uh, Mayor Rep. yes council member Ward. just just to piggyback what did uh, silver stick has changed the weekend compared to what you yeah are doing? they're going three weekends and they're not that last weekend this, so what weekends are they ahead of you yes they're ahead of they're us. not after you mm -hmm. okay yeah. and again we've spoken um, to them and we're gonna try to do something that weekend but 
So this is the, the big uh, enclosed tent out in the front uh, south lot that uh, similar as last year we had a band and you had it heated and people can walk in and out and use the facilities in the transit center, uh, bathrooms and that kind of setup. Is it going to be yes. similar to that? Yep. Okay. And the thing we thought of too with Silver Stick is really it's different groups of people each week so we we're really just hitting that last group, I mean, which is great. Hopefully next week they'll move back to yeah. The, the last, last the last group is generally the uh, the, the home the home teams. Yeah. The Port Huron teams are, are playing in that. That's why. Um, but uh, so this per, this price here is it similar to last year? What the Actually, cost was? It's a little bit less, okay. and that includes heat, staging, tables, yeah. chairs, lighting, um, yeah. and the tent. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll take the vote. Councilmember Harris? Yes. Councilmember Lamb? Yes. Councilmember Ruiz? Yes. Councilmember Warden? Yes. Councilmember Archibald? Yes. Councilmember Ashford? Yes. Mayor Rep? Yes. Under resolutions, item one, please. Is authorizing the termination of Don's Towing Incorporated Agreement, effective September 30th, 2017, and approving the agreement with Preferred Towing Incorporated for towing and related services for a period ending June 30th, 2018. Is there a motion? So moved. Mayor Pro Teb Ashford, is there a second? Second. Councilmember Archibald. Uh, perhaps we could have the city manager explain what happened here. Yes, I sent you all an informational packet with the documentation. Um, we have a, a process in place where it's a very lucrative contract uh, for the towing company, but they collect our fees and then pay the city their share. And uh, we do that in quarterly payments, and Don's Towing simply uh, was not paying us. Uh, they would be delinquent either months or a month delinquent. We would have to constantly uh, hound them to get our, our, our funding. Uh, that was essentially the pass-through money. It wasn't money that they had to pay us. They were actually making money on this. Um, and so it came to a point after more than a year of delinquent payments, we <clears> met <throat> with them repeatedly. Uh, Chief Reeves uh, met with the owner of this company to work it out. I personally called uh, the company to essentially say that this can't continue. It's about fairness in the contract. Uh, when we bid out a contract, uh, we expect people to fulfill that contract in good faith. And when it's numerous times breached, it's unfair to the other bidders and the other businesses in the community who in good faith bid on that contract. The last conversation I had with the owner was it wasn't that he didn't pay the money, he just didn't like the contract. Well, then he shouldn't have bid on it. Um, and so in fairness, to protect the integrity of our contracts and the way the city does business, um, we suspended the agreement. Uh, Chief Baker and I came to agreement that we need to suspend that agreement immediately. Um, they still have not paid us their last quarter that's owed to us, which is money that belongs to the citizens of Port Huron that they hold. Uh, and so that is where the recommendation came from. I sent you all the invoices with the delinquency dates for, I believe, the last two year, two years. Um, and uh, it's just at, you know, 42, 63 days. At one point, we were billing quarter after quarter, and they still weren't paying us. Um, we have preferred towing, which was the only other bidder in this contract. They are a local business. Uh, they have the resources to properly service all the needs of the city, whether that be towing in the street, whether that whether it needs one of our fire trucks or one of our service trucks needs to be towed. Um, they are more than capable uh, of executing this contract in a professional manner. And so that is why, uh, after consultation with uh, Chief Baker, we agreed that preferred towing would just fall in line since they were the second bidder. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Council Member Harris. I was going to just ask you, James, a question. Of the, and it was the, uh, the process that we just went to the next bidder from about three years ago instead of a new RFP. Do you think we probably are going to come ahead? So they're going to write out this contract till June 2018. That will give us time to write an RFP. Um, I, I worry about when, when, we, when we terminate a contract or suspend a contract as a city manager, I worry about, okay, so what do we do now? <laughs> you know, what do you do tomorrow? What do you do the next day? We want to have continuous of service. And so by letting the uh, next bidder, which we do in other contracts, when a, when, a, when a contract falls through, and whether it's an engineering or a road contract, we give it to the next bidder. So this is a uh, very standard protocol for the city port here on. Um, that will give us time to write an RFQ uh, for June coming up. So Good. I think we've got, you. what, nine months left on it. Any other questions? Uh, Mayor Rep. Councilmember Warden. Just to, to, just to further, the 2000, again, I'm the same question, back to 2012 bid, and this contract was for three years, and then it had a three-year extension. 
Um, are you saying that the preferred towing was the only other bidder or the second one? They were the back? only other bidder, I believe, in 2012. Was that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? I will just say I appreciate uh, the uh, preferred towing stepping in on short notice to fill in uh, during the suspension. Um, because of that, our police department did not go unserved. And so for the last, I believe it's 20 some days that they've been doing it, they've done an excellent job for the city so far. Thank you. We will take the vote. Council Member Lamb? Yes. Council Member Ruiz? Yes. Council Member Warden? Yes. Council Member Archibald? Yes. Council Member Ashford? Yes. Council Member Harris? Yes. Mayor Rapp? Yes. Move on to item four. Is uh, confirming the mayor's reappointment of Jeffrey Smith and Rock Stevens and the appointment of Robert J. Arnold Jr. to the Planning Commission for terms to expire August 11th, 2020. Is there a motion? So moved. Councilmember Archibald, is there a second? Second. Councilmember Ruiz, is there discussion? Uh, mayor Rep. Councilmember Warden. Uh, the reason why I set this aside off the um, off the consent uh, agenda. First of all, as the Planning Commission, we've had some feedback uh, from, from some of our citizens and they have uh, um, pointed out uh, that, that, you know, they were concerned about some of the uh, um, attendance uh, with some of the Planning Commission members. And as we started to dig in and into it and look into, uh, I think there was, uh, you know, I guess the response that I heard and what I think we should look into is that there, the way the <coughs> current uh, planning commission, I think it's, um, if you don't mind my glasses here, um, this, this came, I think, from uh, our city clerk here, uh, removal of members, section 2405 in chapter 2 of administration, article 4, boards and commission. The appointing authority may remove any member of any board or commission for cause. And then in uh, section B, it kind of goes, except as otherwise uh, provided by law, uh, specific bylaws of the board. Mem a member of a board may be removed by the appointing authority for excessive absences. The chairperson, person of each board, shall be responsible for notifying the city clerk of any person with excessive absences and the city clerk shall notify the appointing authority to take action. The term excessive absences shall mean for a board which meets monthly on a regular basis more than four absences, excused or unexcused, in any consecutive 12-month period. So I guess my like just seeing some of this back and forth, I, I have to ask, um, we haven't, uh, have we received any, any communication regarding the Planning Commission um, uh, throughout the terms of the ones that uh, you were going to be uh, reappointing or looking to reappoint that expired? I think we might want to just, it's not about who they are and reappointing at this time. I think bringing this to light, and, and I don't know that, uh, it's been brought up and re properly reported throughout the terms of their serving. Um, if they were um, uh, absence, uh, which would consist of you know anything below 75% on a 12-month basis, should have been brought to our attention. And then it would have been nice if it was. We would have, as city council, we would have been made aware throughout the term if there was any some of the uh, uh, planning commission members that were reaching that point, um, we would have been more aware well in advance of the expiration of their terms to address and potentially um, you know, raise the issue of looking to find a, a, a nominate a replacement or to find out what's going on. And it's a perfect time frame when I listen to the Port Huron Area School District talk about the importance of attendance and the pieces of the puzzle. Um, so what I'd like to do is I think we received from uh, some of the uh, uh, some people in our community that have visited that uh, 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 I guess attendance list um, and it shows some people you know at 17 percent or less than 50 percent uh, attendance or even at a 70 percent 
and I don't know if we've had an official, if they actually gave a, a, a rolling um, report back to us, I think we need to kind of look into that to see what, where the ball dropped and what's going on, um, and then maybe look into maybe if we need to uh, do a, a resolution that's changed or something about how to report it in a timely manner, we would know about some of these potential absences of a planning commission members in advance. So I just wanted to bring this up because the current form of the resolution having the reappointment, I just think we should maybe look into the two that you're looking to reappoint just to see about the process first because it was brought up by concerned citizens and us as a city council. I'm, I'm definitely, uh, when I read through and looked at, I think we should be uh, looking at um, maybe uh, amending either your uh, resolution today to the uh, new appointment of, uh, I think it's Mr. Arnold is your suggestion, um, and then maybe look into uh, to see, again, what, what, what happened as far as the attendance uh, of the other two, um, if we may. Well, I have the, just a second here. Thank you, because my mind will not come up here on this. Um, I actually do have the absences here. And now, in answer to your first question, to my knowledge, I personally have not been notified of yeah. excessive absences. Um, so that being said, so obviously it was not something that I could bring to the council. It is the mayor's appointment. And obviously it's the council to make a decision if they want to unappoint somebody. Um, as far as the two that are being reappointed, um, Jeff Smith has been absent twice, so that's not considered to be excessive. Um, Rock Stevens has been absent four times over the past 12 months, but I don't know that that wasn't an excused uh, absence, and I guess I'd have to defer to David Haynes, who is in charge of keeping those kind of stats for the Planning Commission, I, don't, I assume his absences were excused. Yes. Ma Madam Mayor, it does, sorry. just a moment. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it just it said right here in Section 2-405, whether it's excused or unexcused, um, the term excessive absence shall mean um, any more than four absences, excused or unexcused, in any consecutive 12-month period. And I just, that's, again, I was, would hope this stuff we need to address to, to maybe get the, uh, this wrapped around with the Planning Commission, maybe dig in uh, or maybe get the real numbers for the, the last term just to make sure before we do. Um, Those are the numbers. Those are the numbers. Those are the numbers. Ma Madam Mayor, if I could. Well, 25% is... Uh, we don't know. Uh, go ahead. What yeah, did you want to add to yeah, that? Yeah, I just want to say, Councilman Warren, this is the first we've heard of it. I would have gladly provided you these yeah, numbers. I don't know. No one on the Planning Commission except for the member that resigned for personal reasons only she only had six absences and she resigned and that's the vacancy tonight that the mayor has appointed no member of the planning commission has more than four vacancy more four absences in the last year the chairman who has been on since year 2000 yes. and served excellent as an excellent chairman one of the best chairmen of the planning commission i've ever encountered has only missed four and that was a pre-planned once in a lifetime uh, world-renowned trip uh, over two or three months um, he asked for permission from the Planning Commission, was excused. So the reason why you weren't notified of any ex excessive absences is because there has been none except for the resignation that we have and the vacancy the mayor is appointing tonight. So there has been nobody on council except the resignation and vacancy we have who has excessive vacancies. So I'm not sure where your numbers are. We'll email those out to the morning, but you could have, we could I encourage you to call City Hall if you would like those numbers. We can get those for you anytime. Yeah, well, I appreciate your your, your comments. So just as City Council members, um, I thought we'd bring it to attention and something that we need to address. Um, maybe since there's, you know, even maybe we change uh, some language of, of that, uh, maybe look to uh, change some language of that um, uh, requirement to have also the planning director because he would be there as a chair, uh, uh, or at least as running the the, uh, the meeting, he would be knowledgeable and be able to, to maybe it report that uh, uh, on a secondary efficient, on a, maybe a monthly basis to the clerk if uh, keep a rolling tab there, because it's really a rolling twelve. It's, it's it's kind of how how the thing, at least how I interpret it. I think it's something we should look into. Well, at this point, I certainly don't see any problem with the reappointment or the appointment. I think it's something to bring to mind that obviously we do have the mechanism there. If, somebody, if it's fallen through the cracks that nobody's told the council that someone's had excessive vacancies, then um, our vacancies, absences, 
into the wrong thing, uh, then, uh, you know, certainly I, it should be done in the future. But as far as holding up anything for tonight and as far as um, changing anything, I think that the mechanism's there. It's just, yes, it has not been. It, it has depends been reported. on what you say is excessive and what's, I'm know, just reading it. Yeah. It but, just, I mean, I mean, even the council members are not allowed to have more than four consecutive absences unless excused. So I don't think we should be trying to hold our, our volunteer planning commission members who are, uh, give up their time for this and uh, to higher standards than we are. We are allowed excused absences. If we miss four meetings in a row, we are, you know, obviously in violation. But if we are excused, we're not. So... If anything, I, I would eliminate at some future date that says that it's unexcused, that only be unexcused absences, not excused absences. But I don't think that holds up anything for this evening's. So let me just ask, I, again, I don't know the number. The numbers, they, they were just kind of sent in a, 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 a potential. So prior to their expiration of their terms, that that rolling 12 month back for the meetings you're saying that none of them uh, you're saying that they didn't they didn't Nobody have any exceeded four absences okay. except for the one that resigned and she's she's resigned and we're 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 uh filling in okay filling in a person there okay. i appreciate that thank you madam mayor one thing i'd like to say as well is i'd really like to thank the planning commission and the zba um when they do have absences they are very communicative to the planning department. They email David, let them know what's going on. And so not only do they not have excessive absences, um, but when they are going to be absent, absent they, they notify the planning director, they receive their briefings, provide input. Um, and so we do appreciate the, the planning commission taking their, they take their job very seriously, serious enough that if they are going to miss, they make sure that they contact our office and, and discuss it with us. So we appreciate that. Other questions? Hey, Rep, can I jump in on this? Yes, sure. I guess this kind of d disturbed me a little bit because I'm very conscientious about attending meetings, and I think that nothing to, nothing to say bad about the Planning Commission, but I think they have to be the same as, as accountable as, as the city council members. And, you know, it's just like uh, Mr. Gordon brought up tonight, the school district brought us the presentation here tonight, which kind of said everything that I wanted to say tonight. But, you know, you look back, and according to what I've got here from public records, this, this private citizen was able to go to the uh, Planning Commission website. It says that if you go to the meeting page and choose the board plus tab, and this is where the info is. Well, on September 8th at 8.20 a.m., the, uh, the following uh, attendances, we had uh, uh, one person with a 43 percent, uh, another one with 71 percent, and the other one at 14% uh, in attendance. I think and you'll find that that's not based on a 12 months. It's only based on the fact that we only have part of the year and it goes I mean, on a yearly the, basis. The, the figures are there. I mean, we don't, we don't have to argue over this. I think we just, we have to have people have the same amount of uh, process to, to enjoy their job and to do their job as what we do. Uh, I appreciate what James said, but I sat here one night, we waited a half an hour for a quorum to be present for a meeting, and we were meeting with the people from uh, Marwood Manor on their addition and stuff, and another uh, project in Port Earn. You know, this, 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 can't, this can't happen. And when, if you look at these numbers, you know, you can say whether they're over six months period, 12 months period or what, they're unacceptable. And I think we have that right to make that, that position, and, uh, and uh, so be it. Uh, I think the Planning Commission, in, in, in fact, does a pretty good job. I don't think any of them here has an agenda that it's going to benefit themselves, but I still think they have to be a little more regular in attendance, and that's, that's just my position. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions, comments? I think I'll stay out of it, Mayor. Pardon me? Oh, I'll just say oh. I think I'll stay out of that. <laughs> okay. And I do agree that, yes, if you're going to sign up for a board, you do have to have a commitment to that board. But I, I believe the standard should be the same as it is for the City Council. And, and, and that has not been, you know, nobody had, has gone over that. So I will take the vote, or the clerk will take the vote. <laughs> Council Member Ruiz? Yes. Council Member Warden? No. Council Member Archibald? Yes. Council Member Ashford? Yes. Council Member Harris? No. Council Member Lamb? Yes. Mayor Rep? Yes. We'll move on to ordinances, and uh, it would be item three. 
is an ordinance being given its first reading and is an ordinance to amend chapter 38 solid waste and recycling article 1 in general and article 2 permit for haulers and disposable area operators of the Port Huron Code of Ordinances for the purpose of eliminating the annual permit fee and vehicle inspection requirements for solid waste haulers is there a motion so move Mayor Pro Tem Ashford is there a second second House Member Lamb is there discussion? Yeah, could we have explanation around this? Yeah, Lenny, can you come up and give an explanation on the haulers license? I think Sue has some input. You have some input as well. Actually, we put it together. Oh, okay, never mind. We'll, you, we'll let's unless see you then. want to. We'll let Sue. He's gonna sit back down. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let Sue. He's enjoying himself. Um, back when the taxi cab licenses were being eliminated because of state licensing requirements. Um, one of the items in our budget is for those stickers that right. they put on their trucks. At that time, those stickers are very expensive and we, don't, we can't get them in a lower quantity. Mm -hmm. So it, we began looking into and staff talked about, do we really need to have the solid waste trucks inspected because they really get a, a US DOT sticker, which um, they get from the state of Michigan and it is displayed on their trucks. It has to be on the trucks. And those trucks are certified through, I believe, a mechanic that has to certify that everything's in working order. So they've already gotten, they already have to have licensing by the state, so we're a duplicate. They still have to follow our county solid waste plan. And um, by eliminating this, we remove some of that duplication. We already, we're looking for compliance that the truck and is being inspected. Quite honestly, most of the time our trucks, our, our inspection was them showing us the form because they typically got it done just before our license was being done for their um, renewal for their US DOT sticker. The other thing is, is that within this ordinance, all of the requirements here are basically in state law. Oh, okay. So th we're not missing out on anything. There's nothing more that needs to be, like we need to keep in there for these trucks. And police department will still be able to enforce and ticket under state law the same that they would have been able to ticket and enforce under city law. So it's sort of, uh, it's a redundancy. Mm -hmm. Redundancy, so anymore. we're certified by yeah. default because it's already there. Right, okay. right. Thank we you. are trying to look through all their mm -hmm. ordinances Smart. that, you know, where it's a duplication, mm -hmm. where the state has, you know, has some kind of licensing in place that we can use anyways to um, charge if they're not complying with what they need to comply with. So this is one of them. Oh, okay. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Mayor. Any other questions? Just a curiosity, what kind of... Uh, um, Revenue is that generate, uh, did it generate? Not worth the time and effort. It was like $35 <laughs> a truck. And we've been down that road with other permits before, oh, yeah. so that's why it, I asked. It, it okay. was more time and effort by employees yeah. trying to push along the paperwork than really what we got out of it and what they got out of it. Yeah, we've done that with other, other permits, yeah. so Correct. good. Any other discussion? We'll take the vote. Council Member Warden? Yes. Council Member Archibald? Yes. Council Member Ashford? Yes. Council Member Harris? Yes. Council Member Lamb. Yes. Council Member Ruiz. Yes. Mayor Rep. Yes. Item four. Is an ordinance being given its first reading and is an ordinance to amend Chapter 52 Zoning, Article 1 in general, and Article 3 District Regulations, Sections 52-5, 52-223, and 52-478 for the purpose of creating a reasonable accommodation under the Fair Housing Act to allow sober living homes, also known as three-quarter houses, after special approval in an R1 single and two-family residential district and an M1 light industrial district, subject to restrictions that properly balance the interest of other city residents. Is there a motion? So moved. Councilmember Archibald, is there a second? Second. Councilmember Ruiz, before we have discussion on this, um, I believe that Mr. Shawty has a presentation he would like to give us. Excellent call. Uh, Good evening, and I want to thank everyone for having the opportunity to speak about this uh, draft ordinance. Um, we spent a lot of time before the Planning Commission on this. And I'd also like to thank everybody who has provided input and comments, including those who have come tonight and uh, expressed their opinions. Um, some of those individuals who have, who have spoken tonight have provided their opinions to me personally, and I appreciate that. And um, I recognize that this is a very emotional issue, uh, and it's a very difficult issue, and it's somewhat complicated. Um, 
But uh, what's always impressed me about going through this process is that everybody who has spoke about this issue and uh, voiced you know, heartfelt opinions has always done so in a respectful manner, and I appreciate that. The, um, what we have before us tonight is a ordinance that allows sober living homes in our community. That's the goal of the ordinance. Um, right now, under our current ordinances, if we were to enforce the ordinances as, 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 they have dra or they, as they are currently drafted, all sober living homes or three-quarter homes, including Vision Quest, would not be able to operate in our city. Right now, their current model, the way they're operating, is illegal under our ordinances. Um, and, and frankly, our ordinances were drafted before Vision Quest and this type of model came into existence. And the model is a good one, I believe, in many ways. So what we're trying to do uh, is create an ordinance that allows them but places some reasonable regulations on these homes to make sure that we have procedures in place that, that helps guarantee that these homes are an asset to the community, which they can be if they're run properly. Uh, so uh, there's been a lot of talk about the cities trying to close these down and stop recovery homes in the city, and that's not true. We're actually trying to do the opposite. Uh, we have drafted this ordinance, as the city clerk read, we've drafted this to basically create an accommodation, something different. As city council knows, we have a current ordinance, zoning ordinance, that limits houses to three unrelated individuals. And that ordinance still exists. So any person who is, who's gone through recovery can get together and three individuals can still live in a home and our ordinances currently allow that. And there is no restriction on where they come from. There's no restriction on you know, what their background is. That rule currently exists and is currently allowed. What we're doing on our, under our ordinance is these homes want to operate with more than three unrelated individuals. And there are very good reasons why they want to do that. So we're creating an ordinance to allow them and we've set forth how that procedure would take place and what the requirements would be. So let me just back up for a moment and, and let's talk about what is a sober living home. Sober living homes are not drug rehabilitation centers and they're not treatment facilities, they're not detox facilities. These are not a place where an active drug user or someone who is an active alcoholic would go to recover. In fact, to enter one of these homes, you would have to pass a drug test that says you are not a current user and you would have to be sober to enter these homes. And if you violated a rule and you had a relapse, you would be evicted or kicked out of these homes. That's the way these sober living homes operate all over the country. They are one of the parts of the continuum of care. And that's all we're addressing tonight is that one part, is the sober living homes. There is a whole other end of the continuing care, which is something that still needs to be addressed in this community. Is something that Mr. Freed, I know, is actively working on because nobody has started a detox facility or a treatment center in our city. We don't have one currently, and that's something that Mr. Freed is taking some efforts to try to address. Tonight, what we're dealing with is a recovery house. And what are these? These are a place for someone who has already gone through rehab or somebody who is already well on their way to recovery and has already begun the recovery process. And this is part of the continuum of care. It is a way of extending the treatment in a residential setting. And it's a fairly, you know, pr probably something that's really come about and become more common in the last several years, um, but it, they're think it, it's a concept that started maybe a couple decades ago, well before our, our current ordinances were, or well after our current ordinances were drafted. So the program relies primarily upon peer support. 
So people that come into these homes generally will pay $100 a week. They'll have house rules. They'll have um, requirements that they go out and find a job. Um, if they don't have a job, they have to spend a significant period of their day out looking for a job and finding a job in the community. And they have to attend counseling of some sort. Uh, I call it a program. Um, I think it meets the definition of a program under state law. And it's basically something as simple as the 12-step program, which is a very good program to someone going through recovery. Um, and a lot of the components of, of the 12-step program and the concept of these three-quarter houses is a very good program. It's, it's fairly inexpensive to live there. It has a, a positive impact on the person's ability to avoid a relapse. Um, the individuals in the homes are required to be good neighbors. They're required to take care of their property. And in our experience, well-run recovery homes very rarely have problems. Um, they rarely have problems, and they're, they're, there's very little blight complaints. There's very few police calls. Um, these can be, if run properly, an asset. Now, there is another side to this because there are a number of homes that don't meet that definition. There are a number of homes that don't run their places right and are pure money grabs. And you see those all over the place. What municipalities generally do, and I'm kind of standing before you doing the opposite, most municipalities trying to find a way to stop these homes from, from starting up in their, in their city. I'm trying to do the opposite because I'm convinced these homes do good. If you look at the data, and we've looked at several studies, um, it, it's, it's very clear that somebody who is in recovery, the longer a period of time that they're in recovery, the chances of success, a successful recovery and avoiding relapse, go up dramatically with the length of period of time they're in some type of care. What these sober living homes do is they extend that care. They extend that. And if you look at some of the studies on how people have done who have come out of treatment facilities and gone into recovery homes, uh, and, and I, I'm referencing a study by the NIAAA that was performed in Chicago. So in Chicago, they took individuals who had been in a sober living or, or had been in a treatment program, and they, the study includes people who were coming from drug addiction, opiate addiction, and alcohol addiction as well. And they showed that if it was a well-run home, they had success rates as high as 68% after 24 months, which is a phenomenal re recovery rate. The home, and they compared that study to a home, uh, a group of homes uh, that wasn't run as well, and the rate was only 35%. In our discussions with Vision Quest in the city of Port Huron, who's the largest operator in our city, uh, they have reported to us that their success rate is approximately 50% after six months, which is far less than what the better, uh, the, the rate of the uh, better run home in Chicago. Now, we do know that the relapse rope rate for opiate addiction is extremely high. It's as high as 90%. And one of the studies showed that if somebody went through a one month long inpatient facility treatment for opiate addiction, and they, they tracked 109 individuals who came out of that program. Within one week, 60% had relapsed, 60%. And then overall, they had a relapse rate of actually 90.9%. So the relapse rate is very high. And what, what these three-quarter homes do is they help improve the recovery rate. Um, it's, there is no perfect system that's been developed, and this is a fairly low-cost uh, approach. So what we're recommending is that we allow these, but we also have to put in some rules in place. Um, so our goal basically in our ordinance is let's take away any rules or any concerns 
where individuals would have to change their program for the worst to comply with our existing ordinances or avoid state licensure. And let's put in reasonable rules that enhance the likelihood that these programs are true assets to the community, which, which is what we want. And we also have to consider the interest of neighbors and how to balance th that interest. And so what we've done is we have uh, prepared a comprehensive ordinance to try to do that. Now, some would say, well, why are you so specific? Why do you have so many rules? Well, currently, the state has a general rule that regulates substance use disorder programs, but they have no specific rules that address this particular model of recovery homes, and they have no plans to create any rules into the foreseeable future. Their next two regulation uh, uh, modifications don't even include these. So right now we, we are left basically with trying to put something in place without, you know, without any state guidance. So we've done an enormous amount of work. Um, we've talked to other cities on how they've dealt with it. We've talked to other counties. We've talked to community mental health. We've talked to Region 10, um, which is the entity that supervises the state contract for substance use disorder treatment. Um, we've talked to the county health department. Uh, we've talked to uh, medical professionals in, addiction, in the addiction field. And we've tried to come up with an ordinance that we think uh, put some minimum basic standards in place to make sure that these really are providing the service that they say they're going to do. So um, we're going to allow, the ordinance would allow an exception to the ordinance to allow these more than three unrelated individuals in a home, up to six in an R1, and up to 10 in an A1 and A2. But there would be some requirements that they meet certain minimum standards. And we put those minimum standards in the ordinance. Yeah, we're required that they have a license. I believe is currently structured, they clearly do. And in my discussions with Lara, it's very clear that they do. Um, we put in paragraph two, some basic uh, uh, provisions that there's an association that regulates and, uh, um, and creates standards for these homes. And we've basically captured several of those standards. They're required to have admission procedures, you know, house rules, um, rules that require residents to endeavor to be good neighbors. You know, one of the important things to somebody in recovery is community acceptance. And that's one of the ways that the, the standards try to ob obtain community acceptance is they require the residents to be good, good neighbors. You have to have rules in place to address any concerns by neighbors. You have to have rules regarding noise, smoking, loitering, parking that are responsive to neighbors' reasonable complaints. So that's part of the normal of these homes is that they have those rules in place to try to assure their neighbors that they're gonna be good neighbors to them in these recovery homes. They have to have discharge procedures. One of the thing, things the Planning Commission added was a requirement that, that if, a, if they have a discharge procedure that if they're gonna discharge someone, they have to have some place to send them or, or refer them to another place. Obviously, they can't make somebody go anywhere, but they should refer them to some other type of program. Hopefully, someday we'll have one in the city of Port Huron that they can refer them to. Um, they have, we require that they collect data and statistical data. You know, one of the things you'll, you'll notice in the ordinance is a lot of our rules are fairly general. Um, we didn't want to legislate, legislate specifically how they run their homes. We wanted to have certain rules and have those rules reviewed by the Planning Commission when a special use permit is requested to run one of these homes. But we wanted to let these homes basically experiment with different ideas on how to run these homes. Um, there's a nationwide group of homes, Oxford Homes, who does things a little bit differently, and they have a very high, high success rate. Uh, homes could try those diff different types of procedures and rules. And so we set up this procedure where we would finally have serious data collected so we could see which homes were operating well. 
we could see what works, what doesn't work, and make those comparisons. And, those, and that data would actually go to the St. Clair County Health Department, who are far better equipped than we are to review that data. Uh, we put in a requirement that they have a house manager and that certain minimum training be achieved, including a peer recovery associate training. They have at least one peer recovery coach, and that's very common in the industry. And things that were recommended by the medical professionals that we have, those would be individuals that if somebody is struggling to maintain their recovery, they have somebody who's been trained on how to deal with their issues. So those are all, all I believe, very good rules. Um, paragraph 5, which was mentioned um, by several comm commenters tonight, uh, basically has 5A, I don't think anyone disagrees <coughs> with. They have to have a rule that they don't allow a current, someone who's currently using alcohol or illegal drugs. And then we have the conviction rules. And, and basically, this was actually suggested to me by uh, an individual from the county health department. And the suggestion is, you know, one of the hardest things to do is convince neighbors that these are not bad things in their neighborhood, that they should not ostracize the individuals who are in recovery and that they have to accept them. So the suggestion was that we have a rule that prohibits the most hardened criminals from being in these homes. And the theory was that it would be more acceptable to a neighbor. They wouldn't move, worry about their property values, worry about their neighbor if they knew that somebody living in one of these homes was not a convicted kidnapper. They wouldn't have to worry about someone kidnapping their, their children. Um, if they weren't convicted of arson and burning. You see, I picked the most heinous crimes. Um, homicide. Someone who's used poison. Um, someone who is engaged in human trafficking. Those are the ones that would be excluded. Um, we also excluded felony criminal sexual conduct. Not the misdemeanor criminal sexual conduct, just the first, second, and third degrees. And then we also put in a provision for very violent assaults. So if someone had a violent assault within the last five years, they would also be precluded from that home. I didn't, I didn't bar all assaults, just assaults where the, it was a felony punishable by four years in prison or more, which would only capture the most violent assaults or crimes using a dangerous weapon. You will note that there is no exclusion for somebody who has been convicted of any of the other crimes including any drug-related crimes. Hmm. So if they had a history, if, if they needed to get into recovery, the assumption was they may have obtained a drug-related crime during that process. So we did not bar anyone from using any of these sober living homes with that type of conviction history. Um, paragraph 6, I'll come back to in a moment. Paragraph 7, we required that they comply with all of our other zoning ordinances. We referenced the International Property Maintenance Code. Um, these homes right now are probably closest to um, what we currently term a boarding house. But we're not going to require that they comply with the rental ordinance. We're not going to require that they comply with the boarding house rules. Under boarding house rules, you, co you can only have one person per room. And and in talking with operators of these recovery homes, they think it's essential to the recovery that individuals have roommates, that that helps in the recovery process and helps, helps avoid someone being isolated. Um, and so we've only required that they comply with the International <coughs> Property Maintenance Code, which means that a bedroom space, they have to have at least 50 square feet of bedroom space per individual. So if they have a large bedroom that's 10 by 15, they could have up to three individuals in one bedroom. So that's the only rules. And then on paragraph 9, we capped it at 6 and 10, as I mentioned before. Now, going back up to paragraph 6, which I believe was the one that obtained the most attention, um, first of all, I think we have to remember the city of Port Huron is a city that has slightly under 30,000 people. 
we are in a county where we are less than 20% of the population of the county, and we're in a state that I believe has around 9 to 10 million residents. Other cities have recovery homes or sober living homes or three-quarter houses, however we want to term it. Flint has them. Saginaw has them. Detroit has them. Grand Rapids has them. Um, Macomb has some. They are recovery homes all over the place. We are not the only city that has recovery homes. We are not the only city. But in talking to the professionals, addiction recovery that is allocated to our area is based upon per capita. So we only have limited addiction recovery funding that's allocated to our county. So the more individuals <coughs> we take from outside of the county, the greater we're taxing our own resources. And we also have other resources that are taxed the more recovery homes we have. One, we have limited jobs. The more individuals we, we bring in, we know that one of the requirements of these homes is individuals go and try to find a job, which is a good thing. But we have limited jobs for our own residents. We have limited resources as far as police and, and, and other city resources. We are limited. One of the things we have to recognize and have to accept is although these homes do good and they have helped people or helped increase the percentage of those who have a successful recovery, the relapse rate is still very high. And when somebody relapses, they're relapsing into our community from one of these homes. They are evicted from their house immediately. If they come, ho they come home high, they're kicked out into the street. That's the way these homes work. And they have to have that because they can't allow someone in the house to be using when everyone else in the house is trying to recover. It's counterproductive. So they have to have them leave, and they have to have rules in place. So if you look at it statistically, and we have to consider this very real problem. Right now, Vision Quest, 80% of their residents come in from outside of the county, 80%. So only 20% are in county. And even less than that are actually from the city. If we had 100 people in sober living homes and we use Vision Quest's 50% relapse rate within six months, we know of those 80 people who came from outside of the county, we're going to have 40 new active addicts in our community. And at the same time, we have 20 individuals from our, our inside the county who have gone through the program, and we know 10 will relapse. So we've had a net improvement of 10 in successful recovery, but we've brought in 40 who are now relapsing to our community. So what we've done is mathematically, we've increased the number of current users in our city, which is counterproductive to those who are in recovery. The last thing somebody in recovery needs is to have more users around them. They're trying to get away from that. They're trying to su successfully move on and improve their lives. So what we did is we tried to come up with a, a model that we thought would result in a net improvement in the city of Port Huron. We know that the city of Port Huron, we all heard, everyone he was here when the sheriff did his presentation last year and told us how bad the drug problem is in our county and in our city. We know it exists. We know opiate rates are very high in our county. So we know we have a problem. We want this ordinance and us allowing these homes to be a net improvement, a net improvement. And I think what we've done is tried to strike a fair balance. So we said one third in the city, one-third residents in the county, and one-third from outside of the county. So what we're doing is we're saying we're going we're gonna to do our part for our city, we're going to do more than our fair share for the county, and we're going to also save beds for people outside of the county who want to come in. So we're doing 
what I believe is our fair share of helping others. And you have to remember, we are a town of 30,000. We are not the only place where individuals can go who want to enter these types of homes. So in reality, I, there, there was questions asked to me of, okay, why not just set a limit on the number of homes in your city? Well, frankly, we don't know what the need is for residents in our city at this point in time. Nobody's tracked that data. So by coming up with this one-third, two-third, you're basically allowing the market to dictate you know, how many you should have. So the market will determine the need, and that should determine over time the number of homes that you have in your community. And hopefully this will be a net improvement in helping people in our community. So we want it to be a net positive. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I know it's, uh, there's a lot there. Um, I know a lot of you have had a chance to see my PowerPoint, and uh, this was discussed extensively at the Planning Commission meeting. Um, I, think, uh, I think several would, would have hoped that at my presentation uh, didn't go that long. Um, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Mayor Rep. Uh, Council Member Archibald. Uh, prior to opening that up, I, I would like to at least uh, shed some light on the Planning Commission's vote and the reasons behind that so that all of Council understands all of that discussion prior to, so maybe we can answer some of those questions. Uh, it was a six to one vote in, in passing, uh, as you all have already heard from Commissioner Bender, her reasons for opposition of passing this. Uh, we heard from a great deal of, of public comment and many of the people that are here tonight, uh, as well as some others. We talked a great deal about these restrictions and, and the number of the, the ratio that you just brought up of, of the 80 percent and, and 40 coming into our community. And then I heard tonight also uh, that there was a sense of urgency in, in passing this. So what, what transpired at the Planning Commission for us was if we do nothing, we have a, a cease and desist still sitting there that we've been informed is not going away at all. If, if we do nothing, it's going to sit there. So that remains that means more beds remain empty, and we, and we are looking at that preservation of life, and, and no one can get in. So that was a top concern, and, and one of the things that we didn't consider it an urgency to pass this particular ordinance. We considered it maybe an urgency to, to have something happen. We've already tabled it once and then brought it back at a special meeting for, for that purpose. Um, the residency rule, again, it, it was really tossed back and forth at a great length and, and came down to... Um, is it perfect? Maybe not. Is the ordinance perfect? Maybe not. But having nothing isn't working either. And so we, we talked about, do you wait until at such time we've all done enough research and we've, we, we as a community could probably argue this back and forth for two more years and, and at the at same time no one's getting any help. And that wasn't what we wanted to see happen. And then we lastly heard from um, Dr. Annette Mercantant from the Health Department who will be spearheading the committee that will oversee all of this. And she indicated as well that in the interest of what is happening, it was better to move forward and to do something than nothing, and that they would then monitor what is going on in all of the homes, and they would come back to Planning Commission as well as the City Council with their recommendations on what is working in this ordinance, what maybe isn't working in this ordinance once they have some numbers and some, some data to back that, and at that point, uh, they would recommend whatever changes would be, uh, they think would be necessary. Uh, we did ask at that point, um, when would we be able to change this? Would we be locked in for a year? Would we be locked in for a number of years? And the response we got was no. Uh, if, if we had data that proved that this was not working within a month, and we could honestly say it was not working, that we could come back that quickly. Uh, so at that point, um, it was the Planning Commission's decision to pass the ordinance as is uh, in the hopes that we could at least get something going and uh, remove the cease and desist to Vision Quest so that they continue offering the programs that they're offering that we know are working. So that is kind of, in a nutshell, the reasoning behind that and, and why we made the decision we made at that time. Madam Mayor, if I could yes. shed a little light on the administration's perspective and why we decided to... What, what, really spurred this is 
Someone asked an excellent question is, you know, what's the problem that we're trying to fix? I thought that was a great question. Uh, that is the crux of it. Um, we have real issues with good actors and bad actors. Um, we have recovery homes that aren't good actors. We have recovery homes where they have stacked as many as 22 people in a single home with two bathrooms. Uh, it's not safe. It's not the code. It's a money grab. You just stack them in, take their money, not offer real services. We have our police officers that will tell us that when they find someone on a park bench or find someone living behind Kmart or the store, 90% of the times they have a story, well, I was in a recovery home and I got kicked out. Uh, we talked to the recovery home people. We brought them to the table and we said, what happens when somebody you know, is in your home and they drop dirty? What do you do with them? Well, they said, well, we put them up in a hotel for a night. Well, then what? Well, then they're on their own. So they're in a city where they have no socioeconomic ties, they have no money, they're addicted, and checkout's at 10. When we talk about preservation of life, those people matter. We do not have throwaway people. And right now, we have no patient tracking data to tell us where these people are at, what happens to them. Our police officers and our firefighters know exactly what happened to those people. And a large amount of our overdoses are from people who washed out of a recovery home but were never referred to a treatment facility or a detox facility to save their lives. And so that is one of the things that the Planning Commission put in there to refer them. We currently don't have a facility. Uh, Todd and I have been working very hard um, with different stakeholders and, and health care providers to bring a facility here in the near term. And we're feeling very confident that we're going to be able to pull that off. But right now, if you're addicted to... Uh, you need a substance detox facility, Yale's got a three-week waiting list at Sacred Heart. And so we really want to worry about the, uh, the other issue is the balance of the neighborhoods. So imagine you're living in a neighborhood and a home next to you with three bedrooms gets purchased and they've got 15, 12 to 15 people living in there. You have no idea who they are. There's a huge density issue. You have a family. You don't know anything about that home, so it scares you. It deters your property value. And so we have had over the last couple of years people come to our podium and to start listing off addresses of recovery homes and wanting to know what we're going to do about it. And as the city manager, I don't get to pick and choose what ordinances we enforce. When you pass a law, we are required to enforce the law at hand, even if it's a bad law that was uh, adopted in an antiquated time period. And so the ordinance we have on, on record, which is what the cease and desist letter was about, uh, it's based on an old ordinance, and so we want to provide a mechanism that provides a reasonable accommodation that they can operate. Because uh, Todd and I, based on our conversations with the clinical experts, whether it's community mental health, uh, county health department, the recovery home people who came to the table, we do believe that if done right, these can be a, a positive. Uh, but we need to put in place a mechanism that balances the neighborhoods, that provides the patient tracking data, and also accounts to the 50% who, who aren't successful. Those lives matter. And to do nothing, to allow the system to continue, you create a predatory situation where we have good, I think Vision Quest is a good, a good program. They are a good actor. Vision Quest isn't the problem. It's the other actors who are operating in the city who have no regulation, who are just packing these houses, not providing adequate programming. They're not licensed. They're not being inspected by the health department. And these people's lives are at risk. And so this is about preservation of life. This is about making sure that we don't have throwaway people, that everyone matters, and we need to find out where these people go, if they get the treatment they need, or if they need to go elsewhere to get more treatment. Those lives matter. And right now, our county health department has no idea where these people are at. And so the clinical experts are telling us we desperately need this data to develop a strategic countywide attack on this issue. And so that's what's driving this. Um, and I appreciate the amount of research uh, Todd has done. I want to say I, I greatly appreciate the Annette Merkin, Todd, Deb Johnson, and their staff at Mental Health Community, Mental Health, the Blue Water Pastors, the leaders of these recovery homes. Um, you have Vision Quest. You have Odyssey House, who have provided us clinical expertise that went into the formulation of this ordinance. And I'll let Todd handle your questions. Yes. I will... Um Open it up for questions. I have a couple too, but they might obviously be covered. So I will open it up to the council for questions. Uh, well, I'll, Warden. Yeah. Um, make sure you guys don't want to go first because I actually attended both of the city council or the uh, the planning commission meetings, and I sat there and I listened to everybody. 
And I wanted to share <clears throat> that when you sit there and you go and you listen, um, one of the main things prior to this, even getting to the Planning Commission, and people coming up in uh, uh, to our city council here uh, when they heard about a cease and desist was if we're really going to do something we need to make sure that everybody is engaged the more people that are engaged in it the more people that are involved in helping create something that does not exist on paper with the people in the, the community the leaders that have been doing this out there in the field uh, experiencing it to give feedback to have more involvement um, make sure they're part of the process invite them to the, not only just to the table but invite them to the process get their feedback and the one thing that can happen is um, you know I feel is once we got to the Planning Commission um, you know it's it's there it, it's probably an agenda a meeting packet then the commissioners were there and I and during during the initial thing it's like hey we just got all of this what are we supposed to do with it was the first initial thing and then they heard heard the basically heard the the uh, Todd's presentation and and Mr. Freed's uh, uh, comments and, and presentation and then there are also plenty of patient uh, community members leaders from not only from the church from the different organizations from the recovery home from neighborhoods from the uh, landlord associates from businesses from all walks waited patiently then came up and actually had some concerns about the language that they have it's so much and we say comprehensive it's so much that when I listen to this, this is what I got is it, it, it's it's on so many different levels there's questions and my thought is and just to share with not my thought but I want to share this is my pers my uh, uh, going to these um, is I wrote down, I mean, you, you, when you have people that are included in it, but it gets to the table with the, it's all in the wording and the language, and then they, they, they've they came up and offered, hey, we're, we can't, they basically often said that they can't approve it based on the way the language stays right now, but we'd like to look into changing a couple things. And I just watched, and, and just so you know, there was from pastors, from from uh, from again all levels um, but there wasn't any I didn't see any 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 um, any result in, in in that from our public feedback being part of the process there wasn't any real change to some of these or addressing it and to rush through we're almost there if we're going to do something but we, I think some of the from a from a potential uh, I heard heard people's uh, state concerns about discriminatory and, and, you know, the federal, you know, the discriminatory act and, you know, uh, dealing with potential legal issues, uh, as mentioned before, because the city of Port Huron, there is, they mentioned there's no state law or ordinance written yet. So the burden of this super comp comprehensive uh, of approach and language here is going to fall all on the resources of the city of Port Huron to have to defend. And I think somebody brought it up today. I mentioned there might have been a last uh, a planning commission meeting um, about some other places that had to spend you know five six million dollars in legal defense to try to defend an ordinance once somebody goes after something that might be a violation to to, to determine that and I just wanted to one thing is number one I think that we're almost there uh, with out or we still need to when I say almost there we, we still now need to the, the guys that came forward to, to give some of the um, feedback, we need to re-engage them on some of the wording that might be a little too far. I'm going to make a suggestion um, because even if it was for one planning commission meeting and then a special one, that's only a week or two later. You're talking about it, this thing is still, and I know Todd and, and James, you guys have put a lot of time in prior to it coming to this, but we really need to, um, I would like to see, uh, I have concerns, number one, about if maybe we should get a second before we do any type of uh, uh, issue on this, we should probably have it maybe even reviewed by an outside uh, a legal counsel. Nothing against you, but maybe to get a second opinion about a potential um, what what impact is there uh, potential for us to see before we enter in. Maybe there are some suggestions of some wording and things they might want to change um, or give feedback to us. Uh, the other thing is that. What, as far as the rush through, um, 
I, 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 I just... You know, on so many levels, when you have people that were engaged in the process initially, but then when it finally gets written, and then even the church, <laughs> the recovery, uh, you know, a pastor from Operation Transformation, they all came up and they said, hey, as this exact wording stands here, we can't approve this. Uh, and they only pointed out a few sections. We, I, I just think we need to maybe look into that, maybe look to see if there's another alternative to see what may or may not, uh, to, to have the buy-in. Because the number one thing, if, if, if we push something through that they feel, that our community feels is not agreed and being part of, it is the opposite uh, reaction. And I think we need to be wary of that. And I, again, I put a lot of time into to, to listening, to going to the Planning Commission meetings. And I just, when I picked out certain things of, of being said, I hopefully we can consider um, that maybe this is something that not only one needs to be reviewed on a legal sense because our budget is uh, I don't know what the potential open openness would be for financial uh, uh, demands on something like this if we don't do that that initial uh, 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 you know, review first and, and opinion um, and get some feedback on it and then as far as uh, the community leaders you know you had the, you had the landlord association you had we had came up, uh, you had the uh, uh, some building owners, or not building, some residents uh, come up, the neighborhood came up, they from all levels, and they all came up at the final that they had some issues with it. And I think that that needs to be, you know, if everybody has an issue, maybe we can tweak it a little more to where it, if it is going to be something we push through. And if not, maybe we're way overstepping uh, uh, our how, how complex it may be. The other thing I want to bring up is, is how in the world are we going to check and enforce or, or what resources possibly are we going to go into all these homes to keep track of these things, to enforce this thing, the budget for that or even the resources for that and protocol for that um, is going to be something that I haven't heard any real numbers or how to do yet. And I think we need to, before we pass something that, that, that is this potential major, um, I think we need to... Uh, have a little more info on that uh, uh, presented to us here as council and to the public for some feedback. Now, again, uh, the housing right now, you, you, there is nothing uh, on the, the, the books right now that has, uh, it's for residential homes, it's for rental homes, there's nothing that qualifies, so I understand that there is a potential, hey, what do we do about these? But maybe this is where I'd like to have, and I want to share that feedback, that we really should... Um, we're almost there, but let's not rush this to the, this last point. We need to actually take time to address some of these concerns to get more. Uh, when people come and they speak and they communicate as experts to, to the Planning Commission, to us, and they raise questions, but nothing's ever changed or done with their suggestions, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that as, I see that as a potential um, uh, negative uh, that we don't have to have. Because we have everybody coming here that's and, and involved, they, they all want to help. They all are so important that that they're here. So I just say that we're almost there. Uh, the feedback from there at planning commission, with everybody went there, not in its current form. They're not saying they're against, but not the certain things. And I think we either needed to, whether we address it or I don't know the procedure, or maybe we send it back to them. Again, if we're going to handle it here, I think we need to make sure there should be some more. Uh, uh, working of these different, uh, 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 I guess, criteria. Yeah, and, and, okay. and if Thank I you. might respond. Go ahead, yeah. please. And so um, just so council is aware, um, you know, we did seek significant uh, uh, input from a significant number of individuals. Um, we uh, actually formed an ad hoc committee that Mr. Freed formed, um, which invited, uh, I believe there were two or three members from the Blue Water Area Churches who were present. Um, we rolled out the ordinance as it was then drafted, which I believe had been previously shared with council. Um, and in that process, we did listen to the input of a number of individuals, including the Blue Water Area Churches, and we did make some changes. Um, they obviously don't agree with a couple of our provisions. Um, I believe, you know, I disagree with their opinion on that, and ultimately it's up to city council to decide 
what they want in their ordinance, um, and I express my reasons for that. I think one of the concerns we have to look at is, you know, we have to consider balancing of, of some interest. We know that there are various con constituents here. One is, as you mentioned, the Blue Area Churches and their view of how things should be done. Um, we have to consider the people who are residents of our city who are not in the recovery community and who bought homes and want to raise a family in the city. Um, we have to consider the individuals who are going into these recovery homes and their interest to make sure that they're not being taken advantage of. And if you look at our ordinance, we are most heavy on trying to protect the individuals who are going into these homes. The most common complaint with Lara is that these loved ones put their, their family or friends or family into these homes and then they don't get what they thought they were getting. It just turned out to be a money grab. So we're spending an enormous amount of time on that. But if you look, it's really a decision for city council on, on what you want in your city. Do you want to be a balanced city that has development and tries to bring in families into your city, has a, a multi-use um, approach where you're looking at, you know, we have high rises going in downtown, we have lofts being built, we're trying to redevelop certain neighborhoods, we're trying to bring jobs to the community. Um, if we go down this path and we pass this ordinance and we have no limits and then our city, the drug problem in our city dramatically increases, we will have failed. We will have failed. If we don't have some type of reasonable rules in place given the size of our city, and if we fail and we pass this ordinance to allow it, how will that help the recovery community in the state or nationwide. What will happen is no other city will even consider doing what we're doing, allowing them in their community. Because they'll look and say, look what happened to Port Huron. So if we put some type of reasonable rules in place, as Council Member Archibald said, you then gauge the data and see what happens and you have a period of time to look at it, then you will have more data to make good judgment as to how we should change it in the future. And maybe we look at some of these things tonight and after we have data for let's say six months, 12 months, 18 months, whatever the case may be, then we can sit back and say, now we have a basis to make some changes. But right now, with no regulation and homes that are operating in violation of our ordinances with no regulation, they're not even licensed by the state, no regulation at all, we have a problem and we have to address it. And the longer we wait, it's not going away, it's just going to get worse. So I think now is the time to act. And we did spend a lot of time talking to other constituents. And there's no doubt not everything we proposed was agreed to. We did make some changes in that process. We didn't just ignore the comments. And I've had personal meetings with some of the individuals who have expressed their opinion today to talk out my, my rationale and listen to them in detail. At the end of the day, it's this council's decision. It's this council's decision as to whether they want those rules in place or not. We do have to take into consideration, and we're not hearing that tonight because there's a silent group of individuals out there who didn't come and give you their opinion, but they have bought homes in the city and want to see other things develop in this area as well. Let's, let's have recovery homes. Let's be a place where people can come. Let's have sober living homes where our own can be helped and we can help some of the outsiders, but let's have some balance to it. It shouldn't be all, like all, way, all one way or another. And I think any time you look at an ordinance like this, there's a lot of compromises, and I think there are compromises but we're not going to please everybody. Okay. It's not going to work. Thank you, Todd. Is there other questions that council would like to ask of Todd? Uh, uh, go ahead, yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Council I, I Member guess, Harris. Uh, thank you, Mayor. 
Uh, just, just during in the conversation here, what was the decision made to start with the R1, to start there for, for placement? Yeah, I mean, fair, very good question. So right now what we were trying to do is track it to density. So we're trying to come up with some reasonable density rules. So R is single family. So you can have up to three unrelated. R1, you can have uh, one or two family. You can have six unrelated. A1 and A2, where we're allowing up to 10, is multifamily. So they're geared towards higher density. Um, also, what you have to consider is in R right now, we don't allow boarding houses. We don't allow rentals less than 30 days. And in fact, we have an ordinance in place right now where we're not allowing any new rentals. So these homes are closest, I mean, they're different, but the closest use you can compare them to is a boarding house or a rental. And these, remember, these are basically, they pay $100 for one week. So it's a one-week stay, so it's less than that. So, so to put them in an R makes no sense, is unfair to but we everyone else. We, but we can't say for sure right now that they don't exist in our zones, right? They, they, they could exist right now up to three individuals. But if they're more than three, then this ordinance would kick in. You know, I, I understand your presentation earlier. You're talking about the numbers and stuff, but but it still it kind of gets to me that uh, we we have to somehow have a limit and parameters and stuff on, on a number. I you know I I don't know what the wish list would be: 100, 250, 10, 5, or whatever. But I, I think we have to have some parameters there. And we just talked about square footage, and and it's it's. It's incredible that we're, we're talking about recovering people or problem, problem, sober people, and we're talking about the amount of square footage and stuff. I think of myself, and I've never seen any report from the, from, uh, we, well, like say the health department, she never, when I talked with her, she never discussed the issue. We talk, I looked at the sanitation facilities for these people. You know, some of these homes, like say with six people, uh, depending on if it's, a, if it's a small home, we have, we haven't decided that. And you, they could place a place in R1. It could be a uh, we could put put them in a put six of, six of these recovering people into a 500 square foot home in the R1 district, and they wouldn't be in violation. I, it's just I just yeah. people take advantage of the situation. I mean, you you can overrule everything, but but you know these things re really kind of concern me and when you look at that and 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 I talk you talk about the other one as we get bigger the the bigger homes or the whole sober house and stuff we talk about bigger issues with sanitation and privacy and things like that and uh, it's it's huge yeah and just just so you know I, I cited one example from the International Property Maintenance Code there are other rules on bathroom facilities per resident um, that would have to be complied with I couldn't quote all the chapter and verse I'd have to defer to the Dave and he'd probably have to pull up the, the manual because it's quite thick. Um, but yes, that would be one of the requirements is, you know, jamming six people in a 500 square foot home I don't believe would be possible under the International Property Maintenance Code. So the size of the house will also operate as a limitation to some degree. You know, you, so. you look at, and I'm just not pointing at my neighborhood, it's a, it's a hundred year old plus neighborhood and stuff and, and, a, and an 800 square foot home is not uncommon, you know, and uh, you know, with Michigan basements and things like that. And, and uh, it's, there's, there's, there's different issues and stuff. And I, I just, as, as comprehensive as I think most of this is, I, I just still think there's just a couple little niches here and there. But uh, I guess that's basically what's something that Ken Harris is going to have to figure out how he's going to vote on it because it, there are questions, they're tough questions, and uh, I, don't, I don't even think you can get the answer right now. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a tough situation for all of us. Yeah, so. No doubt, and it's, you know, this is a very emotional issue. It is a oh. complicated issue, and we are, to some degree, cutting, you know, new ground. Um, there are, you know, most of the you know, the lawsuits and case law you see out there, it's where municipalities are doing the opposite. They're trying to just come up with rules to prevent them from it being in their community. They're already in our community, and we know we have a problem, and we know that some of the homes do good. Yeah, and there's a, there, those are the people that are going to have the million-dollar lawsuits that they are trying to, yeah, to do away with. we do nothing, so. we'll have lawsuits. Right. Thank you. So. Thank you, Todd. Other questions? I think you, Mayor Pro Tem Ashford, had a question. 
Just to piggyback off of his zoning, um, when I was doing the research on this, you do have to have a established land use, right, correct, and what you're doing? Yes, yeah, this, so is, this is a zoning ordinance. Oh, okay. So, well, first of all, uh, I'd like to begin by thanking you. I know this was a lot of work, about six months' worth. Uh, you've been working on this. And I spent a lot of time on it, there's no doubt. I'm and you checked with a lot trying of Trying to do, you know, the goal is to do something good, right? Okay. So that's the point. And then also, James, and then also, um, when you put out your first uh, talking notes, I had a whole bunch of stuff that was crossed off. I mean, you... It was a mess, you know, sort of like a mess for me. And then um, I see whereas you had really taken a lot out, so I just want to thank you for that um, because it, see, it appears prior that you were trying to take over and put a lot of opinionated as the way we wanted things to go. And I was more concerned about the law. If we're going to build an ordinance, what is it going to be based on? How are we going to regulate that? So that, that was our role. So, but the, but this whole this whole thing it, it is it's it's um, not so perplexed for me in terms. I, I am very attracted to to the to the point that you have been all inclusive because I I certainly as, as as an individual here hate to look at anything just in a vacuum like we're just talking about this community. How do we all come together and we touch here, there, there? You, you touch the community, you touch the recovery community. There was a whole lot of missteps that when they come up to the mic, I don't know who's leading them, but uh, they're trying to say that we're not for uh, recovery homes when we are. You know, they're still in one place. For some reason, somebody's not communicating, and I would like to see everyone work together. And one of the pastors got up there, and he spoke about hope. Yeah, it is hope, but faith, but hope is not there without faith. We've got to have faith in, in, in all what we're doing. And I think to do nothing is not an option right now. We don't have an option. And uh, you mentioned the data. We need the data, not just the data in, in numbers only, but that data and morality. Give it a chance to work. You know, you, 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 we have to start. You know, and if you keep going back here and going back here, you keep coming up with something different, something different. Let's start with what we have here with this ordinance, and it can change. There are amendments. There are everything. There is a, a continuous improvement area thing that has to kick in with this. You know, and I'm going to be watching this because I, I do, uh, when I look at the, the five, you know, when I, when I first got it underneath there, uh, you know, currently using alcohol, and I, well, why would they currently be, this is a recovery. You know, you, gotta, you have an answer to this. Number B, has, has anyone ever been convic convicted of a crime? But you base this on the law. You have intertwined the law within this. You're not seeing this. It's, it, it is established and supported by law already there. We already have law when you're talking about uh, sexual conduct. We already have that where they can't even live. Uh, you know, offenders can't even live with so many feet of that. So, you know, I kind of uh, went through there and analyzed each one of these, these parts where, you know, where they're already in the book and they're already based on safety things. And I think safety is important. And I think we have a responsibility. When we took an oath of office, we're, we have a responsibility to do this. You know, the recovery uh, community have every right and also our other citizens that, that, that aren't in that find themselves in that. But for some way, we have to find that middle ground and we have to try and support each other. But each other, we have to put ourselves out of the way and all these other things that we got that are, that are stopping us to give it a chance to work, to give us more data or, or more a look inside of this to see where we can make the changes going forward and then make them. But you can't stay there in one place and not do nothing. And I do have a question when the, uh, number six, when the, the facility uh, make available and reserve two-thirds of the beds and all this. Okay, and based on your numbers, how many beds will be available during that time? Yes, yeah, so, so if, if you look at, um, so we're measuring the, the, the allocation of beds by the company that's running it. So okay. Vision Quest is a for-profit company. Okay, so Vision Quest, if they had 60 beds through their 11 homes, they would have 20 of their beds allocated to people from outside of the county. Now, I will say their current residents, you know, we're only requiring them to be a resident for six months. So most of their residents are long-term residents who have been in, in the county or in the city for a long time. 
So those individuals are going to qualify fairly quickly and easily. So we're talking 20 of their beds would be allocated to people outside of the county. So, you know, some of the examples I heard of somebody who may, you know, have a loved one who went away to another city and they want to bring them back to the city to recover, there's one third of the beds available for that. That's a lot. Okay, that That's is a lot. A lot. And do you in your, in, in your uh, capacity of formulating this and putting this together, you do foresee some changes going forward? Well, I, I, I think, you know, what we're doing here is, is the best we can come up with with what we have. Um, you know, part of that, if you look at, I think it's paragraph three, is, is what you just mentioned, the continuous right. quality improvement. So we've built that into the ordinance. So we would gather that data, and we gather that data, and we can look and we say, okay, this ordinance, wow, this ordinance is working really well, or certain parts of this ordinance aren't working, or we, we missed this whole issue and we need to address it. Those are all things that, you know, by gathering the data, we put ourselves in a position to, to make an informed decision for the future. Because right now, a lot of what we have, and we have is anecdotal, right? You get some information, Vision Quest telling us they have a 50% success rate after six months. The well Rome home out of Chicago had a 78% after, after 24 months, which is, or 68% after 24 months, which is amazing. You know, that's way better. So my hope is that some of these changes will actually help Vision Quest dramatically improve their numbers as well. And in candidly talking to some members of Vision Quest, they think they can do better as well and I hope this would spur them to do better okay and just mayor just bear with me and just uh, how many of these homes have we identified here in the city of Port Huron well we know Vision Quest has 11 um, every day we get some indication of new ones we really don't even know the number we can't even give you a number at this point we can ballpark it at some place between 30 and 60 someplace in there 30 and 60 yeah which is so we have a number of them operating without complying with any of our ordinances. Oh, okay. So, so, so you, and basically, if they, if they tried to comply with our ordinances, their first reaction would be to change their program for the worst, oh, okay. which is a bad direction. That's what we, want, we don't want. That's part of the reason we have to change this, because right now, if I want to avoid regulation, I remove some of the parts of my program that makes my program successful, which is... That would be a bad result, right? So, so with this, what you gave us tonight uh, uh, in, 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 in this ordinance, uh, have you taken anything from anybody else? Have you benchmarked this to, to? Yeah, I, I have. I have consulted with, you know, other areas. Um, for example, Kent County, City of Grand Rapids. Um, I talked to their uh, community mental health director, who who runs the. Uh, the uh, SUD programs there, and you know, gave, they gave me their input as to how they're doing it. Um, what we're doing is probably, <laughs> I don't know how to say this, but basically a lot of what they do is behind closed doors as opposed to out in the open, and I prefer to be out in the open with what our rules are. So we're a little bit more transparent is what you're I, saying? I believe transparency is the better approach, yes. We shouldn't have, want to have it any other way, okay. So, oh, okay, so, um, and, and Sherry, I appreciate your comments, too. It brought a lot of light to this and, and certainly put it in perspective. Um, and I know we can't, I, I know someone mentioned we want to do our best, you know, and all he ever asks us to do is our best, but nothing beats a failure but a try. And we, and we need to try to start. We need to have the guts to try <clears throat> to move this and move it into a, a position that we can make some changes and do something based on something. I have never seen anything you can't do anything about because you haven't even gave it a chance to do anything. So, you know, I will be voting in favor of this, but even though I'm voting in favor of this, I'm gonna sit here until I'm sitting here and make sure that the necessary changes be made because I'm not, you know, really 100% how it's gonna work out, but I wanna see it work so I can be intelligent enough and astute enough because I care that much to do something about it. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Mayor Rep, Member Ruiz. A couple questions. Um, when's the first time Vision Quest 
Have you, have you learned when the first house was set up? How far back? On, on Vision Quest, um, what was the year, James? It was 12 years ago. 12, 12 years 12, ago? 12 years ago, yes. So. Yeah, and, and. You know, we sit here, and, um, and some of us have a number of years on council. I think I'm eight, nine years, something like that. And um, first off, Mayor Pro Tem Ashford, you did some great questioning there. And I. Thank you. I agree with you along the line in terms of I'm, we can't wait. We have to do something. And I know people refer to a slippery slope, but I think um, there's nothing so slippery that's going to stop me from doing something now. And I, I'm on uh, shoulder to shoulder with the Mayor Pro Tem in terms of we're going to be looking to gather statistics. We're going to be doing whatever it is. It's not this is done. What's the next challenge? This is probably the major, the main challenge I've ever encountered um, on city council. It is because there's, there's people's lives that are at stake. Yes, there are people's jobs that are at stake. We came close to discussing financial ruin for this city and the graciousness of the city allowed us to go forth and look like we're going to remain on our feet and now we can move on helping people that need assistance. We sit here starting out the meeting and, and, and when this first came to light, we didn't know how many houses are out there. We're hearing a guess. Uh, we didn't know what the policies were in these houses. We didn't know what the success rate was. We didn't know who they were treating. We didn't know if they're following basic tax laws and financial situations that are tied in. Not that you can put a price on a human life. I'm not saying that, it's just, were they legal? It's all those kinds of things. And I think you've addressed that. Even when we hear about are there four people in 600 feet, uh, square feet houses, you, I think you addressed that. You said there is a code out there that's going to prevent those kinds of things. There are so many problems that come with this, but at the core of it all is dealing with human life. And this is not just a poor year problem, it is a national problem. It's unbelievable how this is hitting us. And yet 12 years ago, there was a Vision Quest house and um, Vision Quest keeps coming up. It's gone from my initial reaction to, what were these people trying to get money out of such and such? And now it's, they're, they're somewhat of a model from what I've seen, from what I've learned. And I'm hoping that those other ones that we don't even have names attached to them might have to follow suit, not might, they will follow suit as we sit as, as a unified council in terms of uh, following regulations. And we're going to learn an awful lot along the way. And there could be some things written in here that are dead wrong, I don't know. But I, we are sitting here as representatives of this city, okay, the constituents of this city. And that means uh, compassion is everywhere, but we have to look and address what's going on in our city right now and where there's an overflow and we address other, other peoples that are within our city soon, so be it. But I agree that I think we have to move on it now because every time I heard from a number of people in the audience and past audiences before, every day we wait, there's a chance someone is, go is going to lose their life. <clears throat> and I don't want any part of that, so I will be voting yes. Councilmember Lamb, I'm not picking on you, but did you have any questions? <laughs> the one that hasn't spoken up yet. No, I think everybody pretty much yes. covered it, and I agree, and thank you for all your hard work. I, it's very obvious that you researched this quite thoroughly, and I'm pretty positive that uh, it will work. Mayor hey, Rep. Uh, Mayor Rep. I haven't spoken yet. Yeah, I just had, that was just, I had some questions and some stuff I want to share. If I can, just before we do this, I would like to make just a quick statement. I was going to if say, I may, first. Mayor, uh, okay. policy has always been that we all have a Opportunity chance to once speak, to speak, to speak first. Speak. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I guess the, the part about the discriminatory, I don't look at it as discriminatory because, as was said, market demand. Bottom line is, yes, it's two-thirds and one-third, but you're not dictating, we're not dictating how many houses there can be. So there right. really is a ceiling there for if there is a demand for out-of-town residents, I would assume we would have more houses. And it's certainly, I guess, the other point that's, that's uh, you know, not been made is it doesn't have to be just in the city of Port Huron. We are a whole area, obviously, if there is such a big demand, and we do have that demand, and that's something we will find out, we have abutting cities and townships around us which also could have houses such as this, correct? Uh, absolutely, and I, I will doubt that Vision Quest 
has 11 homes in the city. The owner of Vision Quest lives in Macomb County, but he's opened no homes in Macomb County. We don't have, he's not opening homes in the townships or other right. municipalities in the county. It's all in the city of Port, in Huron. The city of Port Huron. And I think <clears throat> the way we've drafted this is we're trying to help our residents. We're doing more than our fair share to help county residents. And we're even opening our doors to outsiders to do even more of our fair share for outsiders as well. Yeah. So. And if the demand is there, then, then obviously we have not put a limit on the amount of houses. I would say it was discriminatory if we said, well, okay, it's going to be this ratio and we'll only have 20 homes in the city of Port Huron and we're done at that point. That's discriminatory because it never gives that opportunity for a bigger balance. And I'm sure you've, I know it's brought up, are we going to have a lawsuit or something like that? I'm sure you've looked into that. I know you've spent a lot of time on that. Yeah, I, and, I, and, you know, as, as you know from, from just reading case, case law or looking at Supreme <laughs> Court decisions, you know, a lot, a lot of times it depends on what judge you draw. Um, you mm -hmm. know, we've, we have thoroughly researched it and we're confident in everything we have. If a judge tells us we have to change a part, we'll do it. Um, but the bottom line is we have a reasonable basis for everything we've done and we've researched it. It's all reasoned decisions. It's the best we can do. And I mean, obviously you've taken into account everybody's comments. It has been, as was mentioned, six months or so that you've been working on it. So I know it's not just something you just dragged out of the, the hat and decided to do. And certainly you've had input from a lot of people. And we could keep getting input and input and input. You still have to have something to start with and we still have to get going. I mean, people have, the audience has said to us, they want us to move. You know, they want, they would have liked to have seen the cease and desist order dismissed, but that can't be because you're in, not in compliance with your current ordinances, ordinances. If we delay and keep delaying and researching, and re we'll never have anything. And, and the Correct. people that need the help will not get the help. So I agree with other uh, council members and the planning commission that, you know, we do need to, it may not be perfect, but we do need to move forward and we need to see how it works and, and get the data and, and move from there. Um, the only other thing I guess I did have a little bit of a question on when you talk about the two-thirds and the third, I'm assuming that, um, I mean, and it will tell over time, but you're not going to have just these open beds there waiting for um, to be filled by city or county residents while there's people lined yeah, up they, at the door. Yeah, bas basically the, the way it would work is they would not, they would not say, hey, we can't find any city residents, so we're going to fill it without a county. They would have to reserve those beds. For the city residents Correct. or county residents yes. at that point. Of course, if that's an issue that comes forward, that's something to bring back to us and say, I have data that shows that I just don't operate at that percentage level, and then we could change it accordingly. C Correct. Yeah, we, we can look at this down the road once we have some data. That would be the hope. And uh, again, the, the rule <laughs> is six months. You know, we're not saying you had to be a resident for a year or two right. years. We said six months. So huh. it's a fairly short period of time. It is. Absolutely. So. I think Mr. Freed had a comment, too, and then I'll get back to you. Yeah, I just want to say um, Councilmember Harris had an excellent point he brought up about his neighborhood. Uh, Councilman Harris, this is a special use permit that they will have to come before the Planning Commission and show their property, demonstrate their property meets the code, meets the building code, there's enough bathrooms there. So your concerns will be addressed during that time period. Like we have a rental inspection fee, we will find out what the cost is to review the numbers. Um, under state law, we can't charge a fee that, that's more than our actual cost. So we'll find out what it takes to annually inspect these facilities, create a special fee structure that covers just the cost um, to do that. Um, in the coming months, we'll probably do that our annual, our, our, our annual budget. Um, I also want to thank Councilman Warren for his comment. I think the council knows by now, um, by the time something makes it to the Planning Commission, um, we didn't just, we don't seek public comment just at the public comment four minute period. Uh, Todd and I have reached out into the community for months. Uh, we developed an ad hoc committee with not only clinical experts, members of the clergy community, um, but also those in recovery, uh, the recovery efforts. We felt that was critically important to get that input. It would be very dangerously naive for, for Todd and I to just try to create something on our own. Um, although we disagree uh, on everything with the, with the pastors here tonight, um, their input has been tremendous in giving us perspective um, and also real-world boots on the ground why these things are successful. 
and, and Todd and I, I greatly appreciate that. One of the things I want to say that's very important in closing is one of the greatest things that have come out of this is the relationships we have been able to build uh, with the, the clinical experts, the recovery community, and the pastors because recovery homes are one component. This is not the last conversation we're going to have. Uh, Todd and I have been working very diligently uh, with clinical care providers from across the state on getting a detox facility here. Uh, David Haynes has been working with a couple of providers to site out a detox facility and treatment facility. We need one here now, not in a year, not in two years. We need one now in the next couple of weeks and months. And so uh, this relationship that we have built, I have created the task force on recovery efforts that have members of the clergy, member of the clinical community, member of the recovery community. That task force and advisory committee that I have formed will be working with Todd, myself, and David Haynes to address the three components of the continuum of care detox, treatment, and recovery. We have spoken to one, and as a community, we still know an answer to the other two. And so this is not the last time we'll have this conversation, um, but I appreciate um, the relationships, the help that you've given us. I know we don't agree on everything, but the input and uh, advice you've given us was invaluable, and we appreciate your efforts and taking the time to meet with us uh, numerous times, and we appreciate that. Councilmember Warden, do you have specific questions that you'd like to ask or that haven't been uh, brought up? No, I just want to make a statement because before I was kind of just sharing and, and asking a question. So um, regarding this um, current uh, form, uh, I think it's, it's, not, it's, a, it's not about uh, um, the, the wanting to do something to fill this need. They're out there to define it. I think my point and... My feeling is that we have gone a little too uh, far on some of it with the feedback, and I think it should be simplified a little bit to get feedback um, to let, uh, if we are going to pass this thing, there's an awful lot, um, uh, some little tweaks that uh, I think were probably pretty minimal that we could monitor um, as they're saying, hey, we can monitor and then change. Well, I think it would be easier to do a little less and then monitor to add more when they've, uh, some of this stuff. Uh, concern is we don't know um, uh, if you uh, push forward with this ordinance with uh, how many people are currently in a facility, in a program that all of a sudden now do not qualify uh, or their house uh, or the business owner who is running that recovery um, currently might have somebody that has a criminal background or falls into one of these disqualified spaces. What's gonna happen? Uh, to those people that are currently in there or what's going to happen to the uh, people who are going to running these that are, are be, going to be coming forward um, what what do they do um, and what we have, we have to look at, or the other side is how are we going to go and find out um, about we're going to go door to door are we going to start going in our neighborhoods are we going to go in i mean how are we going to go and force this it might cross the line so i just think we're again my point is that it's almost there. I, I think in this current form, with so many sides, just a little tweak, I don't think it's uh, in the proper form to, uh, to approve it now. I think we should be uh, uh, looking to some of those small little adjustments uh, and then be able to add to it rather than to try to uh, change and, and take away or pull it back um, is my uh, view here tonight. So. They did an awful lot of work and coming this far, I just think it's not there yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Right, thank I know you put a lot of work into it and you've been standing there for a long time, so <laughs> thank you. I think everybody's had an opportunity to speak, so we will take the vote. Councilmember Archibald? Yes. Councilmember Ashford? Yes. Councilmember Harris? No. No. Councilmember Lamb? Yes. Councilmember Ruiz? Yes. Councilmember Warden? No. Mayor Rep? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Um, concludes the regular part of our agenda. A couple of announcements, or one announcement. Uh, the annual Capture Cops and Jocks Spaghetti Dinner will be held October the 10th. It uh, starts at 4, goes till 8 o'clock at the Seaway Terminal, so please remember to come to that. It's very important that we support that. And then I guess I would just like to say something that just came to my mind the other day. <clears throat> I attend a lot of functions, and a lot of the functions that I'm at, um, especially most recently with the uh, starting with Memorial Day and going into uh, 
the 911 ceremony, and then I was at the park for the MIA and POWs the other night, and then again on Saturday for the Blue Star Memorial Marker dedication. And one group that's always there, and I don't think they really get recognized, so I'm going to take liberties because I have the mic to recognize and just say thank you to the St. Clair County Allied Veterans Council and its Honor Guard. They are at every event. They don't get paid for it. A lot of them are very elderly, and I don't hope they don't mind I just said that, but a lot of them are. And it's hot out there in the sun, and they stand there, and they present the colors, and, and they're there at every event. So I would like to publicly thank them for the job that they do for uh, recognizing our vets and in our community, because there are an awful lot of people who do. It just brought to mind there's a lot of people, well as well as the Saturday on the um, Blue Star Memorial Marker, which was a gift to the city by the Blue Water Garden Club. We have a lot of great volunteers in this community, and I would like to just take the opportunity to thank all of them for what they do to make our city a better place. Is there anything? Thank you. Yeah. May I just? Yeah. Councilmember Harris. Oh. If, I, if I could, I, I, we got another email reminder today from Mr. Singer about these unsolicited things. I have already asked sort of thing. Yeah. for you know, a letter. It's, it's kind of interesting. I went out early this morning to try to get, him, get some of my walk in before daylight. Well, evidently, it's one of the days that they... They put the shoppers. shoppers stuff in the park, in the parking lots, the streets, the boulevards, and everything like that. I, I think he really has a, a legitimate, oh, he does, uh, yes. a point of view and stuff. And and I counted hundreds of them this morning. And I mean, it's it, it, it's just erratic where these people are putting them. And and uh, I hope there's just some little thing that we can do to help them. I emailed him back and I told him that our blight department has effectively worked with myself and some of the neighbors on having this stopped. And hopefully we can get that message out to some of the others because it's it's an issue and uh, Absolutely. I, I'm glad that we're addressing it. Thank you. Yeah, we I've... we we did the the mayor asked me to reach out. We did talk to legal about it. Um, I'll send you guys an email in the morning. But it's, I hate the shoppers guy. They throw that thing every. They just, <laughs> it made it to my house last night at literally 10 o'clock at night when I was taking the trash out. They had just it must have got thrown down next to me while I was sitting there. Um, they put news content in that paper for a reason. And so under Supreme Court rulings, we can't tell them not to distribute it, essentially freedom of the press. We can't say don't throw it. I have requested numerous occasions to stop throwing them at my lawn. Uh, they don't care. I mean, they just keep throwing it. So uh, we'll, we'll send you a legal brief out, but it is annoying. Um, also, uh, real quickly, um, Comcast at 10 o'clock cuts our live cable feed. We only have three hours allotted to us. So this entire meeting will be put on YouTube tomorrow morning. So for before the conspiracy emails start rolling in, uh, Comcast cut the feed. It's probably fake news. <laughs> uh, Mayor Rep, just briefly, I do have something. Uh, a lot of, of our residents were inquiring about the 24th Street uh, Vidoc, uh, where the CNN had promised to uh, do some work on that, repair the uh, the bridge itself, and also uh, maintain the um, the surrounding area. You know, keeping the grass cut. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank our city of Port Huron for doing our share. Ours is always because that property is kind of multi. Uh, maintenance there. You had the township, you had the city, and you have CNN. And what uh, CNN did do, somebody said they didn't see any improvement. Well, they did take away all those trees that were closest to the bridge, and they uh, replaced them with rocks. But they still have um, a long way to go, a serious approach to still uh, taking care of some of that grass out there. And um, as for the bridge improvements, uh, in a communication dated on 8-31-2017, uh, my contact, and I think he also contacted James, um, that the cause of the, the delay has been attributed to the type of repair that they are proposing to do on the bridge. They needed some specialized training to perform this specific or this custom type of repair. And so the problem was stemming from finding a vendor to provide that training. But fortunately, uh, they have found uh, a vendor, uh, and so they're a contractor, I should say, and they have been successful. And so they are currently in, uh, in training now. And so we can look forward to, he 
you can support this. They, we can look forward to them going in there, fixing that bridge up, and I think they're waiting. If you can envision this, the whole thing will change. You know, make uh, some landscaping design and make that look like a like a just a, a beacon of hope in the in the south end of uh, of our city. So that's the, the, the goal, and it's not a dream. It should be reality. So um, we're holding CNN to their promise that they are supposed to do this. So uh, I, we contact him every, every week. You know, I think he go to bed when I'm getting a text message from Ms. Ashford. So uh, hopefully he'll do that. And then also uh, on the transportation, I'm really uh, supposed to give a year in, but this would be old news. Um, the Amtrak station study update, uh, you know, we're trying to find a different location for our train station that is located on 16th Street, and we had 125,000 uh, 125, 100, 125, grant, and then on top of that, we uh, went for another grant for 50,000, so we got that. So currently, uh, within the next few weeks, uh, a study committee will be... Uh, be out in our community, county, and we need to get some information to help uh, satisfy the uh, the grant award. So this is part of the process. So when people are asked what we're going to do with our Amtrak station, they still don't know uh, uh, if, if it's going to be on 16th Street, but they're looking for a different location. But by uh, the application, they have to come to the public, the grassroots public. Uh, I think they met with uh, a Green... Uh, the EDA, did they meet with you guys? So they're meeting with everybody that have them in on this process. So things are moving along, and um, and that's about it. Thank you, Mayor Rep. Thank you. Is there anything else to come before the council? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Meeting adjourned.